board of selectmen, uh, we are running the town. Um, it's an old joke, but it's going to get very much older because we've heard some uh, nasty elevator news. Superintendent Bodie? On the elevator? Yes. We're looking for at least another month out. Okay, we can get comfortable here. At, at, at a much more increased price, I might add, too. Uh, what was the complication we hit? The complication is that the code changed, and we now have to be 12 feet below where we currently are to put this piston in. And they started digging and hit rock. Mm -hmm. So now we have to drill 12 feet through rock. Okay. Drill. And that's going to take a little bit longer, and it's going to cost more money. Uh, joy, joy, joy. Um, so I guess we'll be here for a while. This, this further illustrates the need for a new high school. So uh, anybody who's friends with Deb Goldberg, uh, call her up and tell her we need the school. Um, the other th announcement I would like to make, Mr. Thielman is en route in traffic. He will be here momentarily. Mr. Pierce has banded up, uh, has hooked up with a band of thespians, and he's performing tonight in Burlington. He is playing in a play called Any Given Monday. Uh, we went and saw it last Sunday. It is very worth while well, seeing. Oh, it's a lot of fun. So uh, this weekend it closes, so make sure if you can get up to Burlington uh, and go see uh, Judd play uh, a wonderful role that he was meant to play. It, the, the role was written for him. In any case, uh, we're now going to public participation. Jane Biondi, you're up first. Uh, Linda Hansen will be second. Hello. Hello. Uh, my name is Jane Biondi. I live at 50 Wyman Street. And I am here on behalf of the Arlington Education Foundation to invite the school committee and Dr. Bodie and Dr. Chesson to the Arlington Education Foundation's annual fall fundraiser. It's going to take place on next Monday, the November 23rd, from 6 to 8 p.m. at Flora Restaurant. Um, we ask for a $100 donation per person or $150 for two people, although that's a suggested donation, so whatever you can give will be appreciated. And this is a very special year for us because we're celebrating 25 years this year of um, working together with the district and giving grants to the district. So we're very excited about it, and we would love to see you all at our 25th anniversary on November 23rd at Flora. You'll learn a little bit about some new grants um, that we made this past year, and you'll see some old friends and eat and drink good food at Flora. So we hope to see you there. Thank you. I just want to right away send my regrets. We're out of town on Thanksgiving week, so, uh, uh, and you had the event last week at Thanksgiving week too, which sure. is why we missed it. So. Uh, we, it's a great event, and anybody who's watching this should really get down to Florida, get to eat their food, uh, hang out with some of the nicest people in town. We'll, we'll raise a toast in your memory. Thank in you. Your honor. <laughs> uh, Linda Hansen will fa be followed by Tammy McBride. Hi, good evening. My name is Linda Hansen. I'm president of the Arlington Education Association. And I'm here this evening to address the recent decision of the Board of Education to support Commissioner Chester's recommendation to develop a new state test currently being called MCAS 2.0. It's noteworthy that the vote on the Board of Education was eight to three, with the board members representing parents, teachers, and students all voting against this particular initiative. Um, but I do believe that advocacy on the part of many constituents succeeded in turning away the movement to tie our Massachusetts testing to the multi-state consortium, and I think that was a significant victory. I applaud the fact that we have managed to maintain control of our state test. I feel like Massachusetts educators and administrators will have more success influencing the content of the test with state control. <laughs> I support an amendment that passed 7-4 to four to continue the hold harmless clause for results based on the new test until 2018. That means that the first year of the hybrid test in 2017 will also be held under a hold harmless clause. This amendment was put forth by former Lesley University President Margaret McKenna, who supports the hybrid test but feels like the rush to offer it in a year and a half does not leave proper time for test development, beta testing, and setting standards. Another statistic I found interesting that I want to mention is one I saw in the Globe West section last weekend. 
There it was reported that at the joint mes uh, state superintendents and state school committee conference, delegates took a non-binding vote in favor of the statewide moratorium on high stakes, standardized testing, until a better assessment system can be developed. The vote was 63 to 52 in favor of the ban. This is a conversation I hope to be able to come back to in the future. Tonight, the issue that we take up is uh, later in the agenda is what Arlington should do about our spring 2016 test. The choices are to stick with MCAS for a final year, try out the park paper and pencil hold under the hold harmless clause, or try out park computer based also under the hold harmless. As the people who will be responsible for preparing students to take the test, I feel like it's critical for teacher input to be considered in this decision. I commend and appreciate the outreach from Assistant Superintendent Laura Chesson, with whom I've had several long conversations about how to approach this decision. Laura also sponsored a teacher conversation on the topic on Wednesday afternoon that we both attended. After a lengthy conversation with Laura last week, and after spending a lot of time on the DESE website over the weekend, I put together a document for teachers that explained the decision before us and listed the major factors that I felt were important to weigh in making a decision. Teachers were encouraged to review the information and fill out a survey about what they would recommend for the district. In all, 58 teachers participated in the survey, and that's roughly half the teachers that are responsible for teaching the test in grades three through eight, um, and those were the targeted teachers that I specifically asked to take the survey. In all, about 66% uh, chose to stick with the MCAS for another year, so 38. 15 teachers or 26% said try park paper and pencil with the hold harmless, and only five or 9% said try park with the computer based uh, with the hold harmless. I thought that the disaggregated data would be very interesting, and I do have copies of all this information for you that Karen will be passing out afterwards. Um, but of, it was interesting, so I looked at it by grade level also. Third, grader, third grade teachers, 18% said try out the park paper and pencil, 82% said stick with MCAS. No, no third grade teachers thought trying on the computer was a good idea. In grade four, 8% said park computer based, 46% park paper and pencil, and 46% stick with MCAS. So a little more split there in fourth grade. In fifth grade, 9% park um, computer, 27% park paper and pencil, 55% stick with MCAS. Grade three through five special educators, um, there were only a few. One said try park paper and pencil, and two said stick with MCAS. At the middle school, um, 12 teachers overall responded. 67% said to stick with MCAS. 25% park computer based and 8% park paper and pencil. So another important thing uh, that I thought. Ms. Hanson, uh, we're on public participation. So yep. uh, uh, we're at the So three wrap minute, it up quickly. Yeah, I mean, we, we will ask you to come back and talk when we debate the item. So. Um, Do you want me to save the rest of my comments? Well, sure. Then? Yeah. OK. OK. All right. I'll that'll give you more time and we can interact. Because it's on the agenda and as our uh, association rep. Are you our rep tonight? I am. Then you're certainly a participant in the discussion. I look forward to that. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Tammy McBride, are you here for public participation or are you here for your agenda item? Uh, we can present on the agenda. Okay, then you're not on public participation. <laughs> okay, so we'll, we'll get you in a minute. Rebecca Steinitz. Hi. Hi. It's me again. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm a literacy consultant in urban high schools and an AHS parent. I'm here to talk about tonight's park or MCAS agenda item. I'm glad you will not vote tonight on whether to give park this spring, but I am disturbed that the only indication that you were considering this question was a ge an agenda posted online late Tuesday afternoon. I hope you give the community a formal, well-publicized opportunity to weigh in on this matter Arlington cares deeply about our schools, as you do, and we do not respond well when important decisions are kept from us. I also want to speak to the implications of this week's Board of Ed vote in favor of an MCAS 2.0 that will include park items. There is no question among those of us who have been following this compulsively that Desi envisions MCAS 2.0 as park untimed. Knowing he was losing the public opinion battle, Commissioner Chester brokered a deal for states to use park items on their own tests, announced the very morning he made his MCAS 2.0 proposal, and I'm sure he is confident he has pulled a fast one on Massachusetts. Desi's certainty that the new assessment will essentially be park 
is visible in the comment of a staff member on a conference call Tuesday that Kathy and I were both on. If you have the opportunity to give Park in 2016, you are giving your students and staff a leg up on the next generation assessment. But I question that claim, which is predicated on Desi's assumption that they will get the Park identical assessment they seek. 18 months ago, many of you said that Park was a done deal, which was exactly what Desi wanted you to think. But clearly that deal wasn't done, and this one isn't either. The final Park MCAS hearing on Monday night, where I spoke, showed significant determined opposition to Park. On Tuesday's conference call, Chester was unable to answer questions about the percentage of Park questions in the new assessment or the platform that assessment would use. When Kathy asked about the time frame for receiving Park data next year, I don't know if you know, but this year the data came last week, mm -hmm. not so great for instruction, the response was, quote, roughly the same time frame as MCAS, roughly, which was hardly convincing. So I truly do not see why a district, especially a high achieving district like Arlington, would shift to Park. Every district will be held harmless for the new assessment in 2017, so we don't need to administer unnecessary practice tests to protect district accountability rankings. We don't know what the new test will look like, so we might not even be practicing the right thing. And we could be setting many of our students up to endure three different testing models in three years for no student-centered reason that I can discern. Teachers can still analyze the park items that are finally online, and they can prepare their students for the skills the new assessment should address. But why change tests in the middle of an uncertain process? I hope Arlington still cares more, I'm certain Arlington still cares more about educating children than preparing them for tests. If this is the case, we should be teaching our children, not giving them unnecessary ill-advised tests. Thank you. Uh, anyone else for public participation? Hearing none, uh, we go now to the coaching of teachers in Arlington Public Schools. Um, all right, um, I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Chesson if she would introduce um, our presenters. Thank you. Um, so uh, this evening we, okay, <laughs> one of our presenters just walked in the door, so <laughs> we're happy to hear that. <laughs> um, so tonight um, we have uh, three people who, are who have been intimately involved in our literacy coaching model. Um, we have Tammy McBride, who is one of our literacy, literacy coaches, Don Miller, who is a teacher at the Dallin School, and Thad Dingman, who is the principal at the Dallin School. And I'm not going to steal any of their thunder. I want you to hear um, the great work that they've been doing. Good evening, my name is Linda Hansen. I'm also a K-5 district literacy coach in, um, in the district. And I'm really pleased to introduce, for the first time, I think, in front of the school committee, Tammy McBride, who took the place. I've stopped calling her the new Evelyn. Um, so she has her own identity in the district now. And she has made quite a splash. She's been just fantastic to work with. Um, teachers love to work with her. And we really can see already what kind of difference she's making. So it's been really exciting to work with her. Do you want to say hi? Thank you, thank you for having us, and thank you to Linda. I mean, I have a wonderful role model to learn from, so it's been a great partnership. So we have just, um, so Don, do you want to introduce yourself? Just say hello. Yeah. I'm Don Miller. I've been um, teaching in Arlington for the past 28 years, um, and it's been a great pleasure working with Tammy. What grade? Fourth. Oh, grade. Fourth grade. Definitely. And Thad Dingman. Hi, everyone. Thad Dingman. I've been at Dallin one year. So Don, <laughs> Don has me beat. Uh, principal. And I think they were over at the high school looking for us all, so that's why they're <laughs> just showing up now. 
Um, so we put together just a few slides, very, very short video of um, the co-teaching model that Tammy and um, Don have been using, and then just a few slides at the end. So literacy coaching um, in Arlington. So really, the, our overall, we, we work on meeting together with teachers, analyzing data, supporting teachers in their professional growth, and helping plan curriculum and lessons together with them. The overarching goals are to directly support teachers with reading and writing in these areas. Again, working on new curriculum, working specifically on um, new instructional practices, differentiating instruction for students, and their own goals and growth and development of their practice under the new evaluation system. One of the most exciting parts of um, this role is getting to partner with teachers and actually be in the classrooms. Um, this summer, I had the pleasure of joining Arlington teachers at the Teachers College Homegrown Institute for Writing Workshop. That's where I met Dawn. Um, and in that week of learning together, um, towards the end, Dawn was really interested in learning more about the workshop model and um, kindly invited me to work with him right away in the fall in the classroom, um, which has been a joy. So this um, video is of Dawn and I jigsawing um, a writing workshop lesson, the realistic, realistic fiction unit. Um, and you'll notice um, this is just the first part of the lesson doing the connection and the teaching point. All right, writers, I want to tell you a little story about something that happened to me. When I was on my cruise this summer, I had fallen asleep, of course, being someplace that I don't, that I'm not used to being in. You know, you don't think when you wake, I was awakened in the middle of the night by this banging noise and this movement, and the bed was moving and shaking. I'm like, what, where am I? What's going on? Where am I? I looked around the room, and I still wasn't sure where I was. Then slowly, I begin to realize, oh, I'm, I'm on my cruise. I'm, I, I don't know what's happening, though. And then I did realize what was going on. There's today, Mr. Miller and I want to teach you that just like when he woke up in the middle of the night, was like, where am I? Right? He had to turn the lights on in his cruise cabin. As writers, you need to do the same thing in your story. You need to turn the lights on in your story so your reader knows where is your character, where is this action happening, okay? So as writers, we're gonna teach you today how to turn the lights on in your story so that your reader knows exactly where your characters are. So that's a little bit of Team Miller and McBride in action. <laughs> um, and you know, I think one of the huge pieces that's missing from the video are the, the children. Um, and for Don and I, um, it's a joy. We're having fun together. Um, and if you could see the joy of writing in the students and them responding to the two of us, um, we get to confer with that many more students, meet with small groups, give feedback, um, and all the while just putting the joy into our teaching and the learning for the students. So it's been, it's been a great, great part of the job. Um, Coming out a little bit, looking at the big picture, the coaching role across the district, um, Linda and I are both um, charged with creating and maintaining an elementary literacy site for teachers where we have um, lessons available, um, assessment information, um, resources that support the curriculum um, that we update on a regular basis for teachers. We also plan and present monthly um, literacy professional development across the district on a lot of our Tuesday afternoons, um, and we support and present along with grade level teachers across the district. Um, we also plan and present ELA summer professional development and curriculum work, so we can dive a little deeper and take the time to think about that. And also, um, across the district, we oversee the response to intervention reading program with all the district um, reading professional teachers um, and talk a little bit about program um, implementation for intervention. Our coaching role encompasses the seven schools in Arlington, and at each of those schools, Linda and I travel to provide additional supports and faculty meetings to dive deeper into our new reading and writing units, um, instructional practices, um, so it's a great way to you know, after a grade level of professional development to go into buildings and, and dive deeper and have more time to um, learn with teachers. We also um, go across our buildings and meet on a regular basis with the principals. This is a really powerful conversation that we get to have with them. Um, the principals have been so great in wanting to know more from Linda and I about what would reading workshop look like, what does writing workshop look like, what are the kind of supports and resources we can provide for our teachers. We get to sort of support principals in their goals and teachers in their goals, and we discuss common practices for reading and writing. It's a great partnership. 
So another thing that we do is we meet with teams of teachers on a regular basis. Um, part of our job is to train teachers in data protocols and figuring out how to tie that data back to instructional practices. We also meet with grade level teams um, to support discussions around setting literacy related student learning and professional practice goals. And we support teachers in looking at student work, sitting down with a pile of pre-unit writing assessments and thinking about what is this telling us about what our strengths and the student's strengths and weaknesses are and what can we do to change up instruction and target instruction based on these work samples. We also work, meet individually with teachers. Um, this example of co-teaching that, that's going on at the Dallin School in the fourth grade writing program. We are available to go into classrooms and model um, whole class and small group lessons, identify resources to more fully support and differentiate the instruction. And we also spend a good part of the beginning of the year um, driving around from building to building, pulling our little cart behind us, mm -hmm. dropping off um, the materials for the new classrooms. We had, I think it was five new, um, brand new elementary sections to get all the materials for and make sure teachers knew what to do with it. So on any given day, you'll find us zigzagging around the district with our pulling our carts. So literacy coaching by the numbers, um, we work with two content areas, both reading and writing. Uh, we work at six grade levels, K through five, in all seven elementary schools. And we also collaborate with 12 reading teachers and two Title I literacy tu um, tutors. There are 128 classroom teachers in all that we work with. And we also, um, you know, working with Arlington Public Schools teachers and students is priceless. That'll sound familiar. Um, we're going to just, yep, we have a little send off and then we're going to um, invite Don and Thad up to say a few words. You know, it just came up when we were practicing before. <laughs> It's loading. Any questions while we're waiting for it to load? It'll be up. Soon. Well, while we're waiting, do you guys want to come up and maybe just talk a little bit about your experience? This year meeting Tammy, first of all, in the writing um, program that we had attended this summer was just an eye opener for me because she just zeroed right in on what we need in Arlington for writing. So co-teaching with Tammy has really inspired my ki the, the children in my classroom. The biggest thing that I think I encountered was the boys, we were getting ready, the next class was phys ed, and the boys, not the girls, I said, okay, it's time to go to phys ed. They said, can't we just stay here and keep writing? Now that was the most amazing <laughs> thing out of my 28 it. years of teaching that is, has ever happened, the boys wanting to stay. And it just... I think the co-teaching model with Tammy and I too, we're just bouncing back and forth and it just gets them thinking. And how can I be the best possible writer? <laughs> the other thing is I have 25 students, so trying to meet the needs of the 25 students that I have, being able to zero in on small groups um, with different needs has been great to have Tammy take a group, I'll take a group to work with, and um, it just helps them greatly. Uh, the co-teaching model just works. I've done it in the past when I taught first grade because I really needed that in first grade to just keep the kids going. Um, but the best thing about this is also getting to meet with her once a week and then as a fourth grade team we meet with her once a month to talk about all the writing program that's hap that we everything we need. And she's providing us with supplies and charts and just something that we just don't have time to make half with everything going on in the classroom. So again, having Tammy, she's a great literacy coach, and I enjoy working with her, and so does every other teacher that I know that I've talked to about in fourth grade. And she runs great workshops, too. As, as we wait for Thad to come up, I want to compliment Don, mm -hmm. because he's a good teacher, and he's been teaching for 28 years, and he didn't have to do this. and he put himself out there and he wanted to know how can I even be a better teacher than I am now and I and I I want to compliment him on that because not every teacher is looking to do that and that if you can talk a little bit about what coaching has meant to your building sure um, you know the, the first thing I think about is and I'm sure in 28 years Don has seen a lot of iterations of professional development um, mm -hmm. and just seeing um, 
uh, a veteran teacher. Who, and Don is a, a happy guy, but just to see you so elated um, in the classroom has been wonderful. Um, and, and Tammy and Don have invited me in, and it's been wonderful to sit and um, be a part of it, and also to be part of the feedback model. Um, both have been really open to um, an, an extra set of eyes mm -hmm. as they're going through this. And um, you know, ultimately, you know, I think the best thing that we can ever do is um, prioritize our investments for children. And this investment in teaching and in teachers is really paying off um, for the writers in the classroom. And I think that's really what everybody wants to hear. Like, we're making an impact on achievement. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, and the other thing I guess that I like to see is this is an adult learning mm -hmm. um, model at its best because um, it's iterative all the time. We're learning by doing. They're looking at student work. They're planning together. We're talking in the moment. Um, the the kids are excited. Uh, so, you know, the it, it's wonderful to see this. You know, it's, it's hitting the needs of a 28-year veteran educator. It's certainly, as we continue, going to hit the needs of a range of different teachers. Um, you know, I think our big challenge is, is right now prioritizing, figuring out where can we use this support, um, and we'd like to spread it over 30 different places, you know, because we're talking literacy is the big picture of reading and writing. Um, and and um, we, both Linda and Tammy, and I, I haven't got to work with Linda in this capacity, but I've heard wonderful things too. Uh, you know, everybody wants a piece of this, um, of this support because, sorry to ramble, but you know, one more thing to consider is it is a time where a lot of things are changing quickly, standards have changed. Mm -hmm. We are um, putting really high quality curriculum in the hands of our teachers. It's curriculum that takes time um, to learn and practice, and so um, having two people are working directly with our teachers, so this is happening the best it can. You know, we're, we're thankful for um, the administration also um, for, for making this happen for us in our schools. Mm -hmm. Um, so when we get to budget time, you <laughs> can remember this. <laughs> oh, he's behind you. You might have to. All right, well, why, why don't you just act it out? You can do it live. <laughs> you can do it live. You know, well, we'd have to sing. We have to sing Put Me In Coach. You know that song? Put me in coach. I'm ready to play today. <laughs> And then, and then you see pictures of us. Just imagine pictures of us working with teachers, and yeah, there you go. The selectmen don't have this much fun. <laughs> they don't have this no. much fun. I want to see. Well, we have this much fun all the time. I just want to say so. I see this. It's great. All right. Well, we'll we'll let Adam work on that. Maybe I don't know if there are any questions for anyone well, in the group. Down or? the list. You guys, do you want to come? Here, everyone. Dr. <laughs> Seuss. Uh, yeah, that's, this sounds like a really exciting thing. Uh, just a clarification question: How much time are you in each classroom? So that, I mean, is it, it sounds like you're in great demand, so I'm sure you're pulled in many different directions. <laughs> yes. Um, yes, I think I'd love to be in even more. Um, right now with Dawn's room, where I'm in four, three, days. three days a week and for then. the writing block. Mm -hmm. um, across other classrooms, it's looking differently. If a teacher is asking to come in and see a small group modeled, I might just push in and they watch that once, we have a conversation about it afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's, it's the time and it's the capacity that of right. Linda and I, that there's two of us across the seven buildings. So, um, so we're trying to sprinkle it in however and whenever we can. Mm -hmm. um, but the most amount of time so far has been um, the co-teaching with the writing unit. Uh, Dr. Allison Appy. This isn't exactly fair because it's not your area, but I'm wondering what do we have, this, this sounds wonderful, and I'm wondering what do we have for our middle school students mm. or, and their teachers? I think I'm going to throw that one over to Dr. Chesson. <laughs> um, you know, as we've said, this is a very scarce resource. We're applying it right now into the uh, elementary schools. Um, ideally, it's similar to math coaches. We have math coaches at the elementary level. We do not have that. Um, one of the reasons is because elementary teachers uh, have to be an expert in everything, um, and a lot of the content knowledge um, is uh, tremendous, huge, over, overwhelming at the elementary level. So that's where we have focused our resources. Um, at the middle school model, we have a uh, we have a K through 12. Um, ELA director. So Deb Perry would be going in and, and coaching the teachers and playing a similar role, but also as the evaluator. It would be really nice to have someone who wasn't the evaluator. I think that's one of the nice parts about this model is that this, these people are not, they're about professional growth and development. They're not also part of the evaluation process. Um, so. <laughs> yeah, we don't. 
People are always trying to shut me up. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I thought you guys. Oh, I thought you guys were singing on this today. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, uh, Mr. Hainer. The, thank you very much. It's, it's really exciting to see this. My experience with co-teaching was similar. We had a, a person come in, uh, the uh, director. Is there any thought of co-teaching with the other fourth grade teachers and setting up, uh, looking to find time and doing that as, the, as you grow this program? Yes, I think uh, to that question I would say we have this lab site model that I think you heard about some last year where we have district, you know, leader, teacher leaders that are willing to host other teachers coming into their classroom. I think down the road the idea is teachers get more and more comfortable with this model and start to say, sure, I'll, you know, have people in for a couple times just within my own building or within another subject area. So I think it's definitely part of where we hope to be able to go with it. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Thielman. So thank you very much. It's a great presentation. It was a lot of fun. My question is for Dr. Chess and Dr. Burr. You know, in ter terms of the budget, what do you what do you want us to be thinking about when it comes to this program? Uh, I think it's the impact that this kind of professional development can have. Um, we've talked uh, numerous times about building the capacity of the classroom teacher, and the best way to do that is by in-class coaching. We've seen that with the math t uh, coaches and we're seeing that with literacy coaches so that if you look at us and uh, look at the priorities that we will have set when you see the elementary principals and the secondary principals come in, um, you will hear that this is one of their top priorities. It's one of ours and it's one of theirs. So I guess that's what I'd like you to keep in mind. And, and will you be asking us to think about enhancing this in the FY16, FY? If there was, if there were sufficient yeah. funding, expanding it would definitely extending it, it okay. would be expanding, uh, having another person so that these two ladies okay. mm -hmm. don't have to clone themselves. Okay, yeah. that's what I'm trying to get at. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. I want to thank you for your presentation. Uh, a couple of things is that I do accountability for a living for another school system, and one of the things that we find universally is with strong leadership principle and excellent coaching, uh, we, we get really great instruction in the classroom. Uh, and it, because the coaching model just it, it inspires reflective practice, it, and that's really the key here. And Tom Brady has a coach, and <laughs> we find our best teachers are the ones who are really interested in having great coaching to go with it because there's always something more to learn, something new to try. Uh, another set of eyes is so important, which is why this is such a valuable, valuable program. And uh, just for my colleagues who don't deal with this on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, I can't emphasize enough just how important your work is and how I appreciate this uh, presentation tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Uh, next item up on the agenda will be the park or MCAS discussion, and the superintendent will come back to her chair to join us. Don't get too far from the mic, Ms. Hansen. Not going anywhere. Good. Let me just give you a, um, well, Dr. Chesson's getting this set up. Uh, actually, we've already had a bit of an introduction already in public participation to the situation um, that we are currently finding ourselves in this year. Uh, the, the proposal by Commissioner Chester mm -hmm. to have a different type of assessment that combines PARC as well as MCAS has been approved by the Board of Education. We have, we have been given the option um, to make a decision as to whether we would, we would choose to, to have the park test in, in Arlington in 2016. Um, a decision regarding that needs to be made by December 18th. 
So we have some time to think this through. As we're considering this decision, uh, there are a lot of factors, um, and some of them have already been expressed, and Dr. Chesson's going to go through some of the thinking that we have been doing over the last, uh, actually, few days. We, we had some glimmers that this was probably going to be an opportunity um, for us all when, from a meeting that we had attended a couple of weeks ago. Now, one of the, we've also heard that we would be held harmless. What that means is that if we are at a school or a district at a certain level, depending upon that performance, we are not necessarily going to go, we're not gonna go down a level. It doesn't mean that we couldn't go up a level. It's just that you're held harmless. However, your performance is still available um, to the district and all of the, um, all of the test questions and the, the kind of analysis that we have been doing with MCAS has been promised to be available as well as PARC. I think this year of implementation, it's been a little bit, it has been slow, there's not a little bit to it, it's been very slow in terms of getting this information out to districts, which is not the intent of state assessments. Mm -hmm. The, the intent is that you get timely results so that you can do implementation of, of, of things that you need to work on. So, so that, is a, that is a real issue. Um, uh, it's hard to say. The commissioner said that we would have rough, um, roughly we would have the same kind of timeline as MCAS, which means that we get the results in August and even though the information is embargoed for a while, we are able to plan um, going into the school year. And, and for one thing, we are able to set up, um, for example, at Audison, our different uh, groups for intervention. So hopefully that would be the case. Um, as we, we make this decision, there are different components to it. It is, it is possible to stay with MCAS. However, in this, um, in this proposal, the following year, in 17, all towns, all districts in the, in the Commonwealth are going to um, have MCAS 2.0, which is going to be a blend uh, of the two tests. As they ha was the true last year, it will be true for the next couple of years, you have the option as district to take this either online or in paper form. So anyway, this is the, the, the broad look at this. Um, we we have a proposal, or we have a presentation here to give a little bit more information about it. We're gonna certainly welcome a lot of questions that we have in, in, in time to sort of, to weigh the pros and cons of what the decision, decision will be for the district. Okay, um, I wanna start by saying that, as Ms. Hansen said, she and I have worked extraordinarily closely. I know that you feel that you, you don't have a copy of this, and I apologize, but the decision was not made until Tuesday. I also wanted to make sure that I had sufficient time to go and speak to teachers. I know that was something the school committee gave us a lot of feedback on last year, and so um, I immediately, when it became apparent, um, sort of the direction that things were going in, I went immediately to see Ms. Hansen and said, you know, the vote is Tuesday, given that we'll know on Tuesday what will happen. I am planned to go and, and did go to the um, three, four, grade three, four, and five elementary professional development on Tuesday afternoon, shared with them the vote, um, shared with them the opportunity for them to come and meet with me yesterday afternoon with Ms. Hansen and I, shared with them the opportunity for them to email me, um, encourage them to take Ms. Hansen's survey, uh, answered a few brief questions, but I didn't want to take away the time for their professional development. And I, and I want to use that hopefully as a theme, that while we want to hear what teachers have to say, we also don't want to derail all the good work that we're doing for this issue. Um, we feel like there's a resolution or there's a proposal for this issue that would kind of meet um, both masters. So as Dr. Bodie said, um, in 2017, all of the districts will be taking MCAS 2.0. Um, the DSE is putting out the RFP for right now. Um, I was involved in watching the Twitter feed from the D Board of Education meeting on Tuesday afternoon, uh, Tuesday morning. Um, Commissioner uh, Chester was emphatic that he had done a significant amount of research on how long it would take to bring up the test. 
Um, he spoke, uh, as we heard in public participation, um, quite emphatically in the um, conference call. And this morning at EDCO, I was told that people who have people that are MCAS readers, those are teachers that go in to help score MCAS, have already been, who were originally sort of dismissed and told that they their services were no longer to be needed, have already been asked to come back and look at park items and figure out what, if any, MCAS items need to be fit in with the park. So I think it's a fair statement to say while this test will be under the control, uh, messages control, given the time period it'll be offered, the accommodations that will be allowed, one of the biggest concerns in previous years has been that we had to have offered the same accommodations as all the other park uh, consortium, and now we're free from that regulation. The length of the test and the information that we're gonna release, they'll all be under Massachusetts control. Um, the timeline for this is less than one year, and the commissioner was very emphatic that therefore it, this would fit the description of a test that is substantially based on park. And I think that that's going to be an understatement based on the information that I've gotten from EDCO, the information we got on the conference call, and the Twitter feed that I saw on Tuesday. And the commissioner has stated, actually stated on his conference call, in the Twitter feed, and I think twice in the conference call. The schools that did MCAS last year that switched to park for this spring will provide their students with a substantial leg up in preparing for the test to be offered in 2017. So to me, based on all the information that I have already have, it clearly indicates that the likely the largest proportion of the test that we'll see in uh, 2017 will be from park. What do we know about accountability? Dr. Bodhi has already touched on this, so I won't um, emphasize that um, anymore. Um, what do we know about the reported results? Um, that we would get the results about in the same time frame. She's already touched on that. I wanna assure people that um, there'll be district, school, student, and item analysis results. Um, right now, the item analysis results are lagging because they're in the process of completing the report, and that's why it hasn't been released, but they are, in fact, expecting to release item analysis. Um, and all released items, similar to MCAS, will be shared. Just like MCAS, all MCAS items are not released. All park items will not be released. You can't use some, they use some items to sort of level set um, the testing so they can compare from year to year. If you release those, then everybody knows what the questions are and now you don't have a basis for comparison from year to year. It's the basics of the psychometric that's associated with it. Um, this is a communication plan. If this was, if there are, uh, the proposal to go forward was approved. Um, we had focus group meeting for elementary teachers on 11-18. I'm going to the middle school tomorrow morning. We give every teacher the opportunity to provide us feedback. Um, if we have a recommendation that's a, um, that we think is in draft format, at least enough to share with staff, um, even if it's not approved, we'll, we could say to staff, this is what we're thinking. If this is something that, that we feel that is comfortable going forward, um, we would give out the training plan that we have so that staff could review that as well. Again, even know that this hasn't been voted, but if it's voted in, this would be the training plan so that staff would have as much information up front as possible. Um, if park was approved, we could have lead teacher positions in each of the buildings, um, p someone who coordinates that, and we had that in the plan last year, and we would be able to post those um, in the beginning, in the middle of December. Um, I would be also available to go around to building meetings in November, December, and January, similar to Lee, to what I did when we um, uh, put in the new teacher evaluation system when we were having people come up with DDMs. In terms of parents, um, should we, after this discussion, feel like this is something that has a possibility of going forward, um, we could make a draft um, recommendation and communication out to parents. Um, Dr. Bodhi has an email address that's specifically for parents to be able to send in information. It's APS superintendent. Um, parents could even, after tonight, could email into that email address. I've told Dr. Bodhi I will personally look at all the emails and reply to all the people who um, uh, submit park uh, suggestions, comments, or concerns. Um, and if that's approved, we would put a link on our website for park so that parents could see what was going on, teachers could see um, what was going on. Teachers also have a separate website called the Teaching and Learning website, and all that information would be up there. Um, if this is approved to move forward, we would hold parent forums in the month of January, and I would also be available to go to PTO meetings similarly to the work I did when we first um, began to adopt the Common Core. 
Um, this is a little bit about the training plan. Um, we base this plan on the idea, and we'll keep coming back to this, that we are doing this as a trial run. We are not gonna change our curriculum. We're not gonna change our scope and sequence. We are not asking people to do test prep, that the training will be specifically on the mechanics of the test. As a matter of fact, we want everybody to take, if this was to be approved, to take a deep breath and step away from the accountability table, mm -hmm. okay? Really concentrate on getting those initiatives which are focused on the Common Core, really deeply grounded in all the classrooms, and really say that when we take this test, it's, you know, it's kind of like a, a trial run, it's a trial period. Uh, we don't want to spend a lot of time on the content, but just on the mechanics. How does it work? How would you, um, what are the different question types, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we would recommend, based on the teacher feedback, um, that we, based on teacher feedback, while we feel that we would be comfortable with all the schools taking a computer-based test, I'm sure Ms. Hanson will give you all the details, but that was one of the largest concerns of teachers, and therefore we would recommend that one or two um, schools would do computer-based testing, and we have uh, people in the trenches that would go into all those classrooms and train all those teachers just to get used to, again, the mechanics. Um, we also have an online training video um, that, that would be available for, to review or to cover what students have missed. Um, and the trainings would be focused between February and mid-April, so it wouldn't be too far before the test, but not too close to the test. So some of the concerns or, or the considerations that we have, the first one is about stress. Uh, we don't, we're, our goal is to stress people out less, not increase their level of stress. And the Hold Harmless Clause in 2016 would allow us to gain experience from this test without the accountability stress. And I need to tell you that that is a very real thing. And that teachers will tell you from the day they walk in the door in September, they are thinking that the end of the road is MCAS. That, that th they don't think about it all the time, but it's always in the back of their mind. Um, but there's also concerns about that. We have students, teachers, and administrators that will be involved. If we do any com uh, computer-based testing, IT will be involved. Um, uh, stress will be really higher if we emphasize teachers and students that they have to study, that they have to gear up, that they have to do additional test prep. And so we're not looking to do those things. We really wanna keep the test um, stress down. Uh, there is no long composition for grades four and seven. So their format, mm -hmm. that's one thing that's taken off out of the format. The testing is all in one window and it's late in the year. It doesn't start until April 25th. Mm -hmm. So it allows teachers to really focus on teaching for a longer amount of time and not to have the two breaks in curriculum that currently happen in the testing cycle. Um, you'll see that uh, I talked about the timing a, um, a little bit. Uh, technology, we would have the opportunity to get the bugs out if we have a at least one school that's doing a computer-based testing while at the same time being held harmless. And we do have an option, and Dr. Ver uh, Bodie and I verified this again, that we, don't, we have the option to not have. It's not all or nothing at all. You can have one school do computer-based testing, everybody else can do paper. What you can't do is split a school. That's the one thing they won't let you do. And this will allow us to find out if our Wi-Fi capacity is up to the task. We think it is. We've had some problems in the fall. We've now identified that it's a piece of equipment, a Wi-Fi controller that has to be replaced, and we'll be in the process of replacing it over Christmas break. And we'll find out which devices seem to work better if we have one or two schools. Which ones do, does it seem to be as a better testing environment? Um, again, the length of the test, it is a time test, but students with disabilities and students who are ELL, which is different from MCAS, mm -hmm. um, can have extra time. Um, the results thus far are showing that general education students have sufficient time, uh, and there's a, the state has collected much data on this. Um, it is a longer test in terms of the number of minutes, but it is less testing period, so you don't test in March and then test again at the end of the year. There's only one testing period. Um, some general education students may be stressed by the time in, timed environment, but at the same time, especially students in middle school, as they get to high school, as they t take the PSATs, SATs, those tests are all, um, are, are all time, so it helps them to get um, used to it. Accommodations, there's still something to be found out about the accommodations. There's a number of really nice accommodations that are available in the park and the um, uh, computerized testing, all students can have read aloud, whether they are a general education or a special education They can uh, in the um, math test. They can have it read aloud to them. 
um, if we had a school that was going computer-based, but we had a student in that school that was a special education student for whom computer-based would be inappropriate, paper and pencil for that student isn't a, an acceptable accommodation. Um, there's a, a statement here that IEPs may have to be updated. Last year, um, schools were allowed if, to send home a letter to parents just letting them know that their student's IEP currently did not have anything that called for um, unlimited time on state tests because that wasn't necessary to put an IEP for, for MCAS, but that they were gonna allow their students to do that so that you didn't have to have multitudes of IEP meetings. And as IEPs meetings came up, that would, that would be updated. Um, previous to this, graphic organizers, checklists, and reference sheets were not allowed. Um, but again, since we're, not, we're taking this test sort of isolated from the park consortium now, and we sort of have um, control of our own destiny. That will be one of our questions that we ask. Um, there are two additional um, conference calls next week on Monday and Thursday. And training we've already talked about. I hope it's not next Thursday. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Monday and something. <laughs> Monday and Tuesday. It's next week. It all, it's all blending together for me. Yeah. Um, again, this chart just shows you the number of sessions that um, happen in the MCAS in the park. Um, you know, in, in some cases, there, there are slightly more sessions, but as we said, it's, it's all in one time period. Um, any teacher will tell you that if you have a t any kind of testing session during the day, it kind of blows the rest of the day out of the water. So by confining it to the very end of the year, um, you have a much more concerted time to offer curriculum. what we're talking about. So this is an example of a park math question. Um, this is a fifth grade math question. Um, one of the things that is interesting about this question and different from MCAS is that there are, you have to select two comparisons that are correct. There is more than one right answer. Mm -hmm. It is looking for students to have fluency in multiple representations of um, mm -hmm. numerics and so the MCAS one. Yeah, I'm sorry. And that's the MCAS question that would match to it. So you can see this is a pretty straightforward question. It's just asking you which of the inequalities are true. Only one of these is mm -hmm. um, a true statement. There's only one right answer. All of the questions are in the same format. Did you want to? No. Okay. I, okay. <laughs> This is much, the other one was much more common core. As you can see, it's mm -hmm. asking for students to have a much more um, deeper understanding. Mm -hmm. And it also allow, uh, helps students to be able to figure out things over time. Information that we still want to gather is specific accommodations for special education students, whether we will have to um, modify those IEPs or that waiver was just for last year. Um, we'd like to, I'd like to get more feedback from the middle school teachers. I am going there tomorrow. Um, the final draft of the schedule, we have a couple of drafts of schedule, but we really can't make a schedule until we make a decision if we're going to go forward and if that's going to be paper and pencil or online or a combination thereof. Um, we will still be using, and whether we will be still using the same technology as we did in the pilot, um, which allowed us to not, to not get, try to get too technical here, but when you take the question, it's not like you're sitting at your computer at home and you want to order something online, so you put in the information and you hit enter and it sends it up to the internet and then you get a message back from the internet. Um, we use what's called a caching server, so it's as if you put in the information and it sends it to the computer that's on that desk, and then we put in the information and it sends it to the computer on that desk, and at the very end of the testing cycle, when all students are finished, it goes from that computer up to the internet, so that the only mm -hmm. um, connectivity that you're worried about is that between the individual computer in the classroom and that computer, as opposed to going out to the internet. So what is our recommendation? Um, we have a draft recommendation at this point. We are still collecting information, but right now our recommendation would be that we would do PARC in the spring of 2016. 
um, that one or two schools would do digital and the remaining would have either the option to do digital or pa paper and pencil. We'd like to encourage at least one or two schools and there are, there are schools I have in mind that I think would be a good match based on a whole bunch of things. If none, at least there are some schools that have um, uh, hardwired connectivity so then we wouldn't even have to worry about Wi-Fi. If that became a problem, it would be a backup plan certainly, but um, that's possible. Um, but we also, again, want teachers to have an option to choose. So if a, a school felt it wasn't one of the schools we were thinking of that would do online, but they really felt like that was something that the teachers and the principal decided that they wanted to do, we would certainly support that. Um, again, no changes to the curriculum or scope and sequence. We're not asking teachers to change anything they're doing. As a matter of fact, what we'd like to ch the only thing we'd like them to change doing is worrying about having the students take this assessment in the spring. Um, no test prep except for familiarized staff and students with the format and question types. Completely a try on test drive experience which will allow us to find out um, where we stand in terms of the Common Core. I spoke to most of my counterparts in EDCO this morning. Um, the vast majority of the people in the room, I think there was one person that did MCAS last year. Everybody else in the room had done PARC. I talked to them about their experience and they're sort of seeing a trend that their elementary school students are doing as well or better than they expected, that middle school and math is doing as well or better than expected, and that ELA is the area where everybody sort of agrees that the common core depth of implementation in middle school mm -hmm. is not as deep as we need to be in order to be prepared mm -hmm. for this test. Mm -hmm. That's what their experience is. I think that's what our experience would be, but I will not know until we actually would do something. So. Okay, Ms. Hansen. Yes. Hello again. Um, so if you don't mind, I'm gonna just kind of recap where I was and finish my remarks and then I'd be happy to mm -hmm. answer questions or not. And I know it's kind of um, unfair to read statistical things and not give you paper to look at, but I'm mm -hmm. doing it with a purpose. I just want you to be thinking up here. So overall, again, about half of the teachers who are going to administer the test in grades three through eight took the survey. Mm -hmm. Of those teachers, about 65% said their preference would be to stick with MCAS. 25% said try park paper and pencil, um, under hold harmless, and about 10% said try park computer-based, hold harmless. Um, but what I thought was equally, if not more important, were the factors that teachers um, kind of used to come up with their decisions. So Laura um, mentioned some of them there, but the ones, the main reasons for um, people choosing whatever they chose, and I tried to give them a whole host of pro test park, pro stick with MCAS, just to see what factors were the most salient to them. The six top ones, three of them had to do with technology. Mm -hmm. um, the number one thing chosen was the technology. They did not feel that our IT support uh, we would be able to pull off a computer-based test district-wide. The stress of one more thing to do came in at number two. So again, a lot of teachers are going through retail this year, still aligning Common Core, a lot of rolling out new units at the elementary level, new units in multiple content areas. So that one more thing definitely came up. Um, technology, the current infrastructure was too weak to support computer-based. The fact that it's a time test um, concerns teachers and how students are going to react to that again with the concerns around anxiety. Um, technology, the challenge of coordinating 2,600 students to take a computer-based test, but also in the top tier was the hold harmless clause, the interest in trying out a test um, that, we wouldn't, that people wouldn't be held um, accountable for. Although accountability is fine to say that you're not gonna be held accountable, but they do publish the results still. You can still go online and find them, so in some ways, having public results that aren't accountable doesn't necessarily feel mm -hmm. like hold harmless if you're the one who's being tagged with those results. Um, so I do think, again, that it was significant that technology-related issues were three of the top six, not at all a knock on our hard-working IT staff, rather just an acknowledgement of the daily challenges presented by the growing pains of increasing technology options for students and teachers. And if we're really going to be ready to fully integrate technology into teaching and learning and prepare for a district-wide online assessment, we really would have to make a larger investment in our IT department. So unlike a year and a half ago, I don't come to you with a single recommendation. I, act, I can see merits of both sticking with what we know and trying out park, the park format under the hold harmless clause. 
but I do really urge you to read through um, all the comments that teachers made and, and the factors that they considered. However, if the decision is made to try out PARC this spring, I have two very specific requests that I believe will be critical to the success of the endeavor. One is that the school committee and the administration publicly embrace a PARC trial as an opportunity to try out a new testing platform mm -hmm. with the sole focus on learning more about the way that PARC approaches assessing the Common Core standards. No time should be diverted from the important work the district is, going, is undergoing aligning curriculum and continuing our efforts to support teachers with professional development on instructional practices mm -hmm. and the Common Core units of study. Again, the elementary level, all of the new different um, units of study still being rolled out in science, reading, writing, and math. Um, and that, that work is critical to supporting our efforts to improve the educational experience for students and our alignment to the Common Core. So really putting in a plug for not diverting time um, to studying the new test. And it's an evolving testing system. Mm -hmm. we, you know, we don't really know what it's gonna look like ultimately. And if the decision is to go with PARC, I hope all parties make it very clear. I, I really feel like it's gonna be a big messaging campaign. It's gonna to have to be very clear to parents, teachers, and the community that the accountab accountability system for students, teachers, and schools, mm -hmm. and the district will be turned off. It would be an experiment that would better inform our work going forward, and the goal would be to plan after that first exercise about uh, just thinking about what we learned um, going through that process. So that was one, all of those three. One. Second, if PARC is the direction the district decides to go in, I think the message from teachers is strong and clear. There's a major apprehension around the district's capacity to carry out a full district online administration. Uh, and I really think this could be a disaster uh, for all involved. Thoughtful decisions should be made about the realistic capacity we have to try out the online version in a limited number of settings. And with the current um, timeline that we have in front of us, we have four years to get to 100% online uh, by 2019. So we should consider ramping up thoughtfully in, in stages over time. So many of us have very mixed feelings about some of the features of the current park test, but I know we will have the chance to discuss those concerns more fully um, in the future. And now that we have the certainty of a four-year plan, I urge the school committee and the administration to consider the feedback from teachers and to make a thoughtful decision that clearly articulates the reason for the decision, the goals for the decision, and contains a clear plan to communicate the rationale and goals to teachers and the community at large. Thanks. You'll make sure that a copy of your data uh, is transmitted to Ms. Fitzgerald, who will distribute it to she us. She has them right there. Actually, I just asked her not to do it until after I spoke, but yes, oh. they're, they're right there. It's a lot of paperwork, and I didn't want you shuffling through it all while I was talking, but everything that I just said, including my remarks, the data from the survey um, is all included there. Uh, Dr. Seuss. Oh, okay. Um, yes, I have a concern, two questions, and a suggestion. <laughs> Okay, so the concern is just to make sure that uh, professional development doesn't get hijacked. Absolutely. Uh, so that's my, that's my big concern. I mean, I know that you you're suggesting that we not spend too much prep, put too much pressure, and spend too much time sort of focusing on the test. But just but you will have to do some professional development. But there's a lot more important things than what. <laughs> preparing for a there test. There is no intention that we would um, cancel any professional development that is mm -hmm. currently scheduled, and we would do the professional development um, for the vast majority of teachers during the day. But we also already have a contractual um, requirement to do MCAS prep test mm -hmm. uh, preparation in terms of the administration of it, and we would use that time. Got it. Okay. Uh, two questions. Um, one, you probably don't know the answer to yet, which is what about Audison? Are you leaning or teachers, administrators leaning to doing the park well, test I actually, there the, or? Yeah, uh, Mari Murphy, who was, is the assistant Sorry. principal, if, if, if you want to. Okay. Mari, do you want to? Because Maureen actually helped us administer the pilot okay. at Audison, so she's a mm -hmm. good person who's in the trenches. Would you come forward to the mic, please? Um, so I can speak a little bit about what the experience was like. Um, we had a pilot test um, two years ago uh, for ELA and math. Um, we did, we used the computer lab, so they were hardwired computers. Mm -hmm. um, we did not try um, the wireless at that point. The 
the the tests that the the prep that the teachers did the students did all went very smoothly they each went through um, a tutorial mm -hmm. the teachers and the teachers also had their own training with um, some of the IT professionals in in the district um, and that went well and then I sort of oversaw the teachers and the testing itself and it was it's very streamlined um, for those of you who've been involved in MCAS um, with the prep that goes into it with the labeling and the booklets and the collecting and, and all this, um, all you do is you just print out a, a sheet of paper that has the student's user ID mm -hmm. and, and that's all they need. Um, mm -hmm. So that makes things much simpler. Do you, do you think that teachers in, at Audison would be inclined to want to go to the computer-based test or, or do you think? Without, without having pulled Me, the faculty, own, yes. Yeah. I would think that there's probably mixed feelings um, mm -hmm. with the sixth grade iPad initiative mm -hmm. um, and how much they're being used now. I'm sure they would be interested in, in, in trying it and seeing what it's about. Mm -hmm. um, I think that there's interest in the different levels, um, but we would, I think we we're working on um, collecting the data on devices and usage and, and you know, what, what it would take to, to put it all together. So that's where we are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I have then one more question, a suggestion. <laughs> so this, the, the, uh, no, thank you very much. Um, the s second question is a bigger question that I'm sort of beginning to understand, but don't quite fully understand what this held harmless means. Because I know what it is for a district to sort of be harmed by their scores, right? But mm -hmm. we're never in that status. Like mm -hmm. we're not going to, we're not falling to a level five, right? So, mm -hmm. so, so, I, so I want to sort of just have a better idea of what does it really mean for teachers to be held harmless, you know, to buildings to be held harmless, so forth. The okay, answer so. is very simply, our level one schools will not go down from level one, our level two schools will not go down from level two. Yeah, but that doesn't, what does that mean? I mean, I don't, I, I still don't understand what that means. It, you know, parents who might want to move into our district look at our levels and that might be a consideration for them, but we don't, nothing it seems changes if we go from a level one to a level two. I mean, for example, I mean, uh, where we tend to run into trouble on level two schools is not with the population as a whole, it's with the, the high need subgroup. So that what would happen if you've got a school in that circumstance, if the uh, reason why their level two school changes uh, and, and they move up to level one, they will become a level one school. However, a school that we have that's level one that tries out the test that doesn't do quite as well and trips over one of the uh, uh, trip wires that w would normally move them down, uh, they would not become a level two school during a hold harmless year. So that if you've got, uh, I mean, for example, the high school last year was level one. So that if they indeed are a level one school this year, they would be guaranteed to be a level one through school through the two years of hold harmless. So. That's not a bad thing to happen. I understand that. I, I think I just don't understand what it means for teachers, you know, for principals. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I understand there's a lot of stress, and certainly the school committee is very concerned about mm. these levels and, and our data. But, but for example, how does a teacher, what, what would a teacher feel by being told that he or she was not being harmed? <laughs> well, uh, mm. teachers take very seriously the level of their school mm. is. And in fact, the school, school committee has taken this very seriously over the last few years and having as one of the district goals, PPI scores of, seven, of not below 75 right. uh, and SGPs. So there's a lot of pressure just even from district goals saying that we, we think this is, um, this is important as a, as a district. If we, would, if we were to go forward with this, we would literally take those goals out of our district mm -hmm. goals. Right. They would not be. Um, I think that, I, I wanna also emphasize that we don't punish teachers or, if we have, if we have uh, identified that there is some pattern, and an individual year is no pattern mm -hmm. in terms of an SGP score. Our response is, is not a punitive response at all. It's what can we do to help? Right. And what can we do in the way of extra professional development, some coaching, some mentoring? So that part would not change. But I do think that there is a significant amount of 
internalized stress around the level of the school you're in, and in and I, to be perfectly frank, I think that's been an issue at Audison for many years of of a lot of pressure about performing at a better level every single year. Will teachers and students still want to perform at high levels? Of course they will. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, there's a little bit of, a, of a, a feeling of less stress if you know that we're taking this as an opportunity mm -hmm. just to try it out. Mm -hmm. um, if we wait to 17 on this, not only are we going to be dealing with the variable of, of uh, different types of questions, mm -hmm. Even if we did a paper, we'll be dealing with timed. Mm -hmm. Now, one thing that the State Board of Education did is makes next year as well as hold harmless. So I think um, th that the stress would be off in 17. But on the other hand, one advantage to the district, one advantage to teachers <laughs> and departments is by doing this, we get a sort of a chance to see really the work that we have been doing in aligning with Common Core, the strong work we're doing in writing and reading and math, and to see you know where you know where we are relative to what um, the standards um, are, how the standards are assessed. Mm -hmm. And I think it would be very educational for us in being able to take that information and then say, okay, well, what are we going to do in terms of um, curriculum adjustments? If we, but if we don't get, we don't get the results to the fall, so our summer's gone in terms of being able to really do any kind of curriculum work. So by getting two years, we give ourselves some time in order to do some updating or some adjustments and as Laura was talking about, we have a teaching and learning website which um, is, is, is open to teachers, which we provide a lot of extra support and information in, not to mention all the curriculum maps. So I don't know if you want to add anything further on that. I guess the last thing I would add is that there are many assessments that we give that we've designed based on where we are in our curriculum and where we are in our teaching and learning within the district and being able to be held harmless from the state assessments mm -hmm. and also having that come off the goals. And, and I have to emphasize that by the school committee making a goal, we tell teachers there's the through line. Mm -hmm. There's the mm -hmm. district go goals, then those mm -hmm. translate into school goals, which then translate into teacher goals. Mm -hmm. We would allow them to focus on those assessments that they have developed. Um, DRA is the only other, um, there's a little bit of AMC, but the vast majority of the other assessments are ones that we have developed based on what we think are the power standards based on what we're, where we are in curriculum and to really look at that data and to focus on that data. And you heard the good things that they're doing in those coaching cycles. And mm -hmm. that's the kind of data that they're looking at. Mr. Um, oh, okay. Oh, sorry, <laughs> and then I have a suggestion. Uh, were we to move um, in this direction, um, I would invite you to come to the community relations subcommittee where we are talking about um, doing something big in January and enrollment and then doing something in March on curriculum and, and sort of to coordinate those efforts. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Mr. Hainer. First off, I'd like to state that MCAS 2.0 is just putting a new cover sheet on Park. Mm. There's no way you can put a quality testing tool together in a year and a half and dramatic changes in it. So it, to me, it's just a new cover sheet. Saying that, the issue of anxiety, you get used to doing something, it does not alleviate anxiety. As the child grows older, the stakes become higher. And that magnifies the anxiety on the thing. So knowing how to take the test alle alleviates that aspect of it, the mechanic of it, but not the content. So the anxiety gets bigger. The changes in this, I'm, I'm a little bit concerned hearing that we're talking about doing some electronic and some mm -hmm. paper. There's two parts to doing uh, something new. The content part is doing a different test. I understand that part. But the other part is the learning about the electronics. Until we have a full uh, assessment of all, everyone taking it electronically, we're not going to know what's happening. I'm also concerned, and I'm sure you have something, if we're taking the data from the child and putting it over here in a server or, or, or I hope there's some sort of backup because the day, the moment you press go and it disappears, mm -hmm. that, that scares me. Um, 
You mentioned before the state won't allow in a building some paper, some electronic. But then I heard you say that the, the, the it has SPED. to be by school. Pardon me? It has to be by school. Well, he's here but, by but you also made it, you, you suggested that there would, might be an exception. I don't know whether that special is a Special education. Mm -hmm. Special is, education students. Is that a fact or is that one of the questions that you still need to get clarified? No, that is correct. It is an accommodation that's allowed. Does that require an IEP in place for that accommodation or can, the, can if you have a child high anxiety that's not on a high IEP but you know it's going to have a direct effect. I'm going to have to check that out because one of the things, as I said last year, is that they were able to make accommodations without an IEP team convening, and I need to find out if that's going to be held the same. It, it, I don't think you, you cannot do it on the fly. I will tell you okay. that. Okay. But but I it, whether it requires an IEP team meeting or not, I have to find out at the, the I think conference that, call. That's very important. I absolutely because, agree. Because of all the FERPA aspects yeah. to that as well, all of a sudden we're putting another tag on, on the uh, special needs child. One of the selling features, we have a new test. We're talking about assessing the common core and, and the state, the, the things there. I have a deep respect for our teachers, uh, the professionalism uh, on there. Every teacher is not waiting for a state assessment coming back to assess what he or she is doing in the classroom. Mm -hmm. Good teachers are doing that on a daily basis, moment to moment basis, going forward and keeping accurate records. We've put a lot of time and effort in training our teachers on dealing with data. And I'm sure a lot of them are doing that separate from standardized testing. To push us into something because it's going to give us an edge up. Two years ago, everyone was talking that Park was going to be a fait accompli. Well, the reality is it's not. And I would suggest the possibility, it's a gamble, it may not be a, a, a push two years from now, right now. We may be looking back and uh, uh, Dr. Ampey and I went to uh, EDCO with uh, school committees the other day, and those people that took it last year are taking it next year and will be assessed on it. They will not be held harmless next year. All, 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 all districts are. They, well, they, they were, yeah, all districts, they got held. The, there, well, they was, would, there was a revision to uh, the, at the meeting. That okay. There was a motion made okay. by one of the members to extend the hold harmless. One of the uh, uh, memo calls for the state and I'm quoting it, commit to computer-based state assessments with the goal of implementing this statewide by spring of 2019. There is little uh, support for that at the State House on a monetary basis. The issue of timing, going to computers would get data back to the co communities very quick. That's not going to happen as long as a big chunk of this state is doing it on paper. Mm -hmm. That's a fact. And so to practice it for the sake, uh, for the reason of finding out where we are on the idea of park, uh, or the assessment of the Common Core, I can understand that. But as far as the technology part of it, unless we're all doing it, unless the state is all doing it, I don't know where we're going. Can I just, uh, I just want to just say right, one thing. Because I've heard a number of people say that, uh, that park, we, we said it was going to be park, 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 and then that's not true. But I also heard you say that the MCAS 2.0 is parked with a different cover sheet. Mm -hmm. So both of those things cannot be true. I if agree. It's, it, so I agree with you that I think it's parked with a different cover sheet. And so therefore, I do think we know what the test is going to look like. But the problem I have with that is that a, a vast majority of state, a, a group of states and a, a lot of communities in this state have said, we don't want park. We don't want park. We, we want the, the concept of saying we're going to create a hybrid of MCAS and PARC, I, if that is true, it's going to take multiple years to do it. I, to, see, I think okay. that's true. And, just... and, and to just change the name in order to sell a product, uh, you couldn't do that in the real world, uh, change a product that people don't want by just putting a new label on it to sell it. I think that it will be true that this is going to be a test that evolves, and that was true with MCAS. Yes. I can tell you that mm. the early MCAS was very different than the MCAS a couple of years later. So I, I, I don't think, I think that that is absolutely going to be the case. One of the, besides the issue of curriculum, um, you mentioned a number of factors that are different in the test, which we acknowledge. There's the timing part of it. Um, there's just there's a different emphasis and a, approach to the types of questions. And then there's the online. One, one advantage of this year of potentially maybe having paper 
in some schools, and I would I would I would allow this I would allow schools to choose allows to take some of the to separate some of those factors in over two years. So this year you you get the experience of what the types of questions are. You get the experience of timing, mm -hmm. which is a new experience. Though the the I, I, from what I understand, um, while they give a, a time for it. Uh, the vast majority of, of Gen Ed students do it in about two thirds of the time allowed, but some don't. So it's a new it's a new paradigm in testing. We don't do time testing in our common assessments. And then you could in, you could integrate the next piece of it, which is the technology. You know, having both at the same time. If you're not in that kind of platform regularly perhaps adds a, a whole dimension of stress to it that we could decouple by spreading it out. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's a consideration too. If I may, just one response. Sure. You mentioned about the test evolving. MCAS evolved because it was Massachusetts mm -hmm. and took direct feedback from Massachusetts. This is not going to be just Massachusetts. This is going to be dealing with, it, if it's Park, it's no, going no, to be. It is. No, it's I understand that, but, but the, if the feedback as presented in the memo is going to be a, a consortium of Massachusetts people, of educators, parents, and things like that, you're not going to be creating that hybrid within a year. That's all I'm saying. And if you are creating the hybrid, which, which interested me, and it, it will have this evolving uh, communication with the state and stuff like that, then it becomes a unique test to Massachusetts. And it won't be this big piece out there that, that Mr. Chester is selling for his company. Um, can I make a comment? Go ahead. Um, I think that if you were starting from scratch and writing questions, I would totally agree. But the hybrid is really a, a mix and match. You can take the test, the questions from Park, but we have a bank of thousands of questions from MCAS as well. And so it's a question of just choosing which, which ones. It's, to say that there's not rigor in the MCAS would not be correct either. There is some rigor and there's some questions that are actually quite rigorous. In fact, in the Globe article the other day, they had a Park question and an MCAS question. The example they gave, I thought the MCAS question was more rigorous than the Park question. So it really, there's a, there's a combination of both. I will say that um, the, one of the things we do in literacy um, and have been doing is looking to do much more writing and using evidence. And of course, uh, Tammy and Linda were talking about how you sort of light up the room a little bit with it too. But, but we also do a lot a around um, writing that's just not a narrative writing. And that has not been uh, assessed in the same way on MCAS that it is on PARC. So, you know, we, are, we have moved forward in the district in terms of um, a much more of alignment in some very important things, which are kinds of skills that our students need to be successful in our ever-changing world. And uh, MCAS, frankly, has not kept up with it. They had predicted that MCAS was going to be more aligned, but it turns out that it really hasn't been as well as it... So, there are a bank of questions, and, and if you get educators together and you say, okay, let's put this together, you can create a hybrid. If you're going to start from scratch, you're absolutely right. Uh, let, let, let me go on to Ms. Starks. Um, uh, first a question. Is math um, also going to be in April? Because the slide said only the ELA would be. I'm sorry. It's all everything. The mm -hmm. whole testing window is from April 25th to June 6th. Okay, so that would mm -hmm. be a yes. Mm -hmm. Um, I also found it interesting that um, in the survey that Linda Hansen did that um, even though it was MCAS versus Park paper, so two paper, um, MCAS won out handily two to one, e over two to one. Um, so, and yet what was interesting is that all of the comments were, that were negative were about the technology. So that confuses me because if I'm just comparing to paper tests, I'm not talking about technology. So that was kind of weird. Like they overwhelmingly want MCAS at the number one thing they're worried about is the technology. Um, and so that kind of confuses me because one of the choices was just to stick with 
the park paper. And so that that's kind of weird. But um, I feel like that one thing that um, gives me pause, I think, is that I feel like that this is being rammed down our throats. I don't like the fact that we have, you know, two weeks to put a plan together for dealing with this over the next three months. I really feel like that we need to be, I want to slow down the train. I want to make us think about it. I want, if we have to get to all computers by 2019, I would rather see a very detailed plan. I want to know when each and every student is going to be trained, when each and every teacher is going to be trained, and I want to see us ramp up. I in no way um, am for jumping on this bandwagon right now. I feel like there is a lot going on. There's a huge wave of discontent around all of this standardized testing, um, not just in Massachusetts, but across the country. And that, um, and I'm sick and tired of listening to Mr. Chester, I really am. I mean, he doesn't know what he's talking about. He, you know, he seems to be running in whatever direction the dollars seem to be falling into his lap. Um, and it, it's just pissing me off. I mean, I, I'm so, I, I just feel like I know MCAS isn't great, but right now we know MCAS. And if we take it one more year, we have one more year of data that we have and we get nothing from Park, nothing useful, nothing in a timely manner. Um, and I don't feel like we've had the time to really sit down and think about it. It's not that I question all of the great planning that you've done and that I don't think that we could do something, but I feel like everybody would feel so much better if we had a very clear plan about how every single student was, when are the first graders all going to have been tested? Are we really sure we got them all? Even Johnny, who's been out with the flu for three weeks, you know, like I... I just, I don't want to rush into this. Um, I feel like, you know, we're being forced to do it. I, I don't mind that the test is going to change over time. MCAS has changed over time. But I don't feel like I want to be the one to jump in. And so just like I voted against Park last year, I will vote against it again this year. Mr. Thielman. I thought you voted for Park. Yeah, you voted for Park. You did. <laughs> you yeah, you did. yeah, you did. No, I would not vote for Park. <laughs> did not vote for Park. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that I was one of the dissenting voters. I don't remember that, but okay, yeah. I could be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Your Facebook I have to check the, check the records. Um, <clears throat> so uh, my question is this. If the um, school committee voted to stay with the MCAS mm -hmm. and uh, we continued with a, uh, the goal system that we have right now. Yes. And we said... Uh, uh, we wanted to have a, SG, a, a, a SGP of 50 uh, as our goal <clears throat> and uh, a PPI of 75 for high need students or what, what I can't remember the X. Uh, what, what does that do internally um, uh, in terms of, in terms of, in terms of what, a what, what, what are people going to think about that in, inside the schools? What's that going to mean to a teacher who's going to know that in a year that test is going to go away and it's going to be meaningless? And how is it going to be received internally if that if I, I, I don't know that I can answer the question about whether it's meaningless or not. I, I will go back to the statement that the school committee sets goals. Teachers are well aware that those goals translate to school goals, and those goals translate mm -hmm. to teacher goals. So if the school committee keeps those goals, then teachers will keep those goals. The other thing that I want to caution the school committee is that uh, levels, while primarily driven by the individual school scores, there's also this in the bottom 20%. Now, would we end up in the bottom 20%? Unlikely, however, no. <laughs> uh, unlikely, unlikely, but we are being compared against, part of our rating is being compared against other schools, and as the sample size gets smaller, the impact of one school or another school's impact on your rating gets larger. So I guess the question I'm asking, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to understand the academic value of putting all this time and energy into a test that's going to go away. So preparing for the MCAS, worrying about the scores, spending time at school committee meetings looking at the data, uh, worrying about whether or not you've met PPI or SGP, um, what, what is that, where does that get us as a district if, we're, if this test is going to go away? 
I would say that it doesn't move us forward. Um, we, we, even though I think there's, a, there's increasingly a little um, a disconnect between MCAS and the work we're doing, um, particularly in ELA, I would say, yeah. uh, I would, we're gonna continue the work that we're doing because it is, makes the most sense for students, the, ki the kind of emphasis on writing and the type of writing that they're doing, the kind of critical thinking that we're asking students to do in math, the uh, next generational science standards, which are gonna eventually become part of our, our science testing as well. Um, we will continue doing that. Now, um, are our students gonna continue to perform well in MCAS? I absolutely think so. Do I think that they would probably do well on the park test? Yes, because our curriculum has been increasingly aligned to the Common Core. I, know, I think that there's a lot of um, been mis uh, align. There's been a misconception in general in the public, and it certainly become very political that there's something wrong or not good about the Common Core. And I would have to say that I couldn't disagree more. Uh, I think the emphasis on the type of reading that we're asking students to do is long overdue. Um, while there's a, it's wonderful to be able to do a lot of fiction reading, the reality of our world today is we have to have discerning reader, readers to be able to read um, sometimes very dense material and make sense of it, to use what they've learned to make arguments that are gonna, that is going to be represented in their writing. And that is the work we're doing. We, we don't, MCAS, no energy has been put into MCAS to continue that effort to align more and more to that. So yes, will we continue to do well? well we will. Um, I, I see this as an opportunity to sort of decouple some of the stresses, spread it out. Um, but we could also certainly go another year. Um, we have common assessments that we use to, to, to understand how we're doing and we'll continue to do that as well. And those assessments are teacher written. They are often reviewed in curriculum committees over the summer. Um, so our teachers are very much involved in both the development and the assessment of the work that we do. And the state test is just one piece of further data that we use. An, I'm not saying it's not just one, it's a very important one that we take very seriously and as, as the committee does as well. Um, at some point we are going to be, um, we, the, I think that it has moved forward for whatever, whichever way you agree or disagree with it, the state is moving forward to a different type of testing. And it's going to be different te testing in terms of its content uh, what it's expecting of students, and it's also going to be different in terms of the form in which students take tests. That's already that's already happening to adults. I mean, that happens with adults, teachers, when when students take, um, you know, GMAT tests. You don't take those tests hardly anymore on paper and pencil. It's just not how it's done, and it's going to increasingly be that way. So that is the flow, that is where it's going and we can either start moving in that direction or we can just sort of wait till we think that it's in a more perfect state. I mean, that's the choice before us. And that's why we wanna, I'm glad they're giving us to the 18th of December because I think it's something that we you need to have time to reflect on. And um, certainly as we have more information, we would um, provide it to you. I, I know that while there was a big reach out yesterday with Laura and Linda, no teachers came to that meeting um, to talk about this. So we, we're, we're dealing with, a, um, it, is a, it is, was a, a sample, but we, the teachers for the first time are really understanding where we're going to. I don't know when they reflect on, on this over the next couple of weeks, how their thinking about this is going to evolve as well. So we're all at a, at a, a new place in a new direction and we have to see what our choice will be. So a couple, couple points I want to follow up on is um, I, I would love to hear from principals on what they think about this. Um, I, you, uh, I, I have a concern about uh, thousands of uh, students in Arlington taking a test that isn't gonna, that's going to be obsolete, mm -hmm. studying for it, 
or not studying for it, but being prepared for it in classes, classroom time, uh, taken up, uh, getting ready for a test is going to be obsolete. I, 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 don't, I don't think that's good policy. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's responsible policy. Um, <clears throat> I, um, I, I interact with elementary school parents because of the age of my kids, and there, there's many, there are several parents that have already spoken to me, have emailed me and said, you know, and that, these are folks that have some uh, uh, experience in public education in different districts. And so their position is, boy, it would be great to have my son or daughter uh, uh, take a test for a year that doesn't count. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a feeling that some parents in our district, some of the people that uh, uh, send their kids to our schools think about. And I think we've got to listen to that. I'm going to listen to that and hope other people do as well. Thank you. Dr. Allison Ampey. <clears throat> I have a few questions and a comment. Um, my first question is, how is Park educationally a better choice for students? Well, you want to go yeah, I think it's off? a, um, as I think we, we showed one question, I could show you even more, um, that is requiring students to utilize the skills that we're focusing on. Um, the sad part, well, I have now taught elementary, but I will tell you about middle school and high school students, is that when you teach them something, the first thing they want to know is, gonna, is it going to be on the test? Mm -hmm. um, because we've set a long-standing mm -hmm. uh, cultural that we assess those things that we think are important. So when we emphasize to students that they need to be able to take information from multiple sources mm -hmm. and they need to be able to give us multiple um, forms of the answer or they have to be able to fastly go from one form of a number to another, and then we don't assess it, and the big assessment that they have at the end of the year doesn't assess it, I think it sends a mixed message. So I think educationally, we're asking students to then utilize those skills that they've been practicing all year in, in a very real way. Um, I also think for those students that think creatively and out of the box, just the finding the one answer, um, I think doesn't allow, it has a very low ceiling, and the park test has what we call, is, it's got a high ceiling, so that we have better information about those students, even those students that, that do exceptionally well. Um, MCAS has a, a very low ceiling, and we get to a certain point, and we, and we have no information. Um, and we find that with some of the other assessments, and that's what makes us look at a different assessment. Um, we're currently looking at an additional reading assessment because the DRA score only up to a certain point has, has a very low ceiling. Mm -hmm. So I would say that that's educationally, it, it, it sort of validates the kinds of things that we're asking kids to do. It also provides us with additional information about students that are on the high end of the ceiling. Um, and there are also accommodations when we get into the when we get to the point where we would take a vast majority of students would be taking it, if not all students online, is that it allows um, for accommodations for every student, um, so that the test is really about measuring what the students know and are able to do, as opposed to what they're not able to do. Mm -hmm. um, say better. Go ahead. I had voted for MCAS last year because I thought that the district would be better served by a longer ramp up to, towards doing electronic testing. What has been done to better prepare the district for taking park this year versus last year in this intervening time? Um, the, uh, um, of course, the elementary schools have really been ramping up. For example, Stratton now has nine iPad carts. Um, they have uh, something like 18 regular classroom teachers. So t students are using technology on uh, a regular basis. They're very facile um, and comfortable with it. At the, uh, at the um, we're now getting students that are coming out of Thompson that also were from the one-to-one -one -one environment that are going into the middle school, and then they're coming into sixth grade, and they have a one-to-one -one -one environment. Do I think that we're perfect? No. Do I think that from grades actually from grades K through eight, are we doing a pretty bang up job with exposing kids to technology and getting them comf comfortable about it? Yes, I absolutely do. We have some ways to go in nine through 12. I think we made some great strides this year. Um, I think by stressing the system this year, as painful as the first month or so of school was, it was being stressed because we put I think David Good told me yesterday, a thousand additional devices. So we kind of tried to break the system and we succeeded 
some mm -hmm. weeks, um, but we've been able to figure out, okay, this one was a filter problem, so we need to change those filters, um, software filters. Mm -hmm. um, we know that the controller that we thought we were gonna be able to limp along with, because it's four years old, mm -hmm. not happening. And not only that, but we know that even when we put in that controller, eventually we'd like to go to, if we were to go to full, um, digital, we would want a backup controller. Mm -hmm. So we are learning more and more about the support side of the system as well as the skills that we're giving our students. And I think that the stu this, I think that when we see what happens at the um, AEF uh, event that they have in the spring and we have students demonstrating what they know and are able to do with technology, the committee has been amazed and I think that that's happening more and more every day. So I do think the students are comfortable with that. I also think that because we waited and I know that that wasn't my choice, but we, because we waited, we got more information on what kinds of technology are best for the test. Mm -hmm. Originally, the um, makers of the test um, recommended that you, use, for example, use keyboards with iPads. They found out that that actually makes the application less stable, and that if you didn't use the keyboards, you actually got more stability. Mm -hmm. So we've been able to work with our counterparts in EDCO to get a lot of information about what it looks like the best platform would be. So I think that those are kinds of things that we've done. And although I understand people feel like they're being rushed, I, I want the committee to know that after the vote last year, we spent significant amounts of time and continue to have spent cons significant amounts of time planning for what we thought was inevitable. Mm -hmm. So while it may feel rushed to you, it, it feels almost like a fait accompli for us because we kind of saw what was coming. And I, I know it's hard, and it doesn't feel good, and that was one of the reasons why Dr. Bodie and I talked about the fact that we would have a first read tonight, and you know we have till December 18th, and that they have even said if you need a little bit longer than that, you can have it. I mean, the longer that we wait, I think the more uncertainty there is. Mm -hmm. But if it waiting another week and having me talk to elementary school teachers again to say why did you say no, stay with MCAS, but all the the concerns that you raised have to do with technology. Is, is that because you thought that we definitely were going to go on? You know, I mean, <coughs> I have no problem going and talking to teachers and bringing back the committee more information. Mm -hmm. Okay. I just, um, no, got more. Okay. Um, if we participate in PARC, will we have better access to information about the test? I'm thinking mm -hmm. as the development of MCAS 2.0 takes place, mm -hmm. will we have better information to better informed counter proposals mm -hmm. um, or does it not matter if you're in park or not? I don't think so. Okay. Well, we'd have student yeah, data aligned. We'll have student right. data. Okay. And, and we'll have a personal experience that would be able to bring to the table as opposed to sort of standing on the outside. Okay. I would say last year that was an exceptionally true in the, the sense that if you were not and people were talking at EDCO this morning well when I looked at this when I looked at that and I was like what are you talking about because we did not have access to that information. Okay. Um, so then my concerns are first that park is timed and I am worried that that's going to be a problem not for everyone but for that chunk of students who are staying in for recess because they're not quite done with their MCAS that those kids are now going to be hit with you know clearly you didn't finish mm -hmm. and that's especially when they're little I mean it was bad enough when they were having to stay in from recess they still talked about you know this person didn't have um, and this is going to be even worse. It won't necessarily be as visible as the staying in. Um, I'm concerned that if we're feeling rushed, that when, if the decision is made to go to park, that parents are going, I, I understand Mr. Thielman has parents saying, you know, ready mm -hmm. to jump on the bandwagon, but I think a lot of parents are going to feel like they're not sure their children are ready. For an electronic test. I understand you're saying we're only going to do it in one or two schools, mm -hmm. um, but actually I'm, I'm with Mr. Hainer that that's the part that I'm the most concerned about testing and making sure that it works is, is the electronic. I, I think mm -hmm. I'm with the teachers. I feel like I just don't see this working and I'd rather shake out the issues. Um, and I understand that there seems to be a whole lot of push towards park, but I'm just concerned even with all of this push that at the heart of it, it's a flawed test. 
and, and I understand mm -hmm. that we're going to be forced to do something and it looks like it's going to be this, but I still think it's a flawed test. And I don't like putting our students through something that is a flawed test. And I, I just, I don't see a good answer. I, I hear what you're saying that, well, MCAS looks like it's a dead end. So I just, you know, I wish we could just vote for none of the above. <laughs> yeah, no. Well, I think that the, the year off. <laughs> yeah. I think the, you know, th those are va certainly very valid concerns. I think the issue of um, concern about the technology, at some point, that's going to happen. At some point, if it's going to be this year, one school, we're on a, unless the Board of Education changes the vote over the next four years, we are on a trajectory that that's going to happen. And having it be in a smaller scale at a time when there's sort of a held harmless um, is not a bad time to do it, to see what my kinks might be. Um, we did not have that experience with the pilot, but the pilot is, is a different test. We are going to be having time tests. That is going to be the reality that we're going to be having down going forward. Mm -hmm. um, but they're, they may find that they might make the, the periods longer, which they didn't do, as far as we know, for this year based on the results of last year. They found that the amount of time that was given was very adequate. And the kids that needed more time were able to get more time through their IEP. Um, and this year they'll extend it to students that are English language learners. There is always going to be a time when you're going to have an adjustment issues and a little bit of that. And you, but you take those, you know that you're going to go through that, and you learn from it so that you're going for the next time it's, you know, you, you correct. Um, so one advantage is that you don't have too many variables at one time. Mm -hmm. And that is something to, something to consider. Um, Next year could be that we just, you know, that could be what you decide. And next year, um, there's still the option of doing paper. But at some point, we're going to have to do some testing to see how, you know, our own beta testing to see how that's going to work in our district. Mm -hmm. um, we have, what well, we, we've made big leaps this last year uh, in terms of usage, in part because we now have teachers who are doing more with it. It's, we have the devices to do it, and there'll even be more next year. Mm -hmm. That's true. But we're not, we're not saying to do the whole district that, that way right now. Um, so those are, those are concerns, and, and the issue of, of students being anxious about a test, that's, simp that's not going to change. It's just not. And um, I, one of the things you always hope you can do for your children and other children is that you give them enough experience with it that with practice anxiety does go down the longer you put off something without having that experience you can you can increase anxiety I don't can I just clarify when I was mm -hmm. talking about the length of the time of the test and whether that would create anxiety I'm not concerned I think it will create anxiety beforehand. My concern is it will create a sense of failure for the children who are unable to complete the test afterwards. And just that, and, and I'm talking about general ed students. I'm not talking about mm -hmm. special, um, people who have IEPs that can have extended time or something. I'm talking about kids who are unable to complete the questions in the time that's allocated. And I just, I think, I mean, we'll see what happens, but I am concerned that there will be students like that and that that is a very defeating kind of feeling and that I just, I don't see how that's helping them. Right. Uh, there were 220,000 students that took the test. They have significant amount of data about whether students that there was, that was a pervasive thing that happened. The data shows that in fact, not only did, did that not be the case that there were many students that did not finish? There was, in fact, uh, the students were only taking about two thirds of the time. I, and and can I just say that as a person who's proctored SATs, I have a vivid memory of 
personally being in an SAT and not being able to finish. Um, but when you proctor SATs now, kids are kids are not not finishing the test. They're sitting there doodling or staring at the ceiling. So I'm not sure if that also has had you know a change in the testing length. Um, but this they, they have a, a significant amount of data from two years that talks about h how many kids mm -hmm. didn't pass the test and um, get finish the test and it's extraordinarily minimal and those students generally are students who are are special education students Dr. Seuss um, I just have a question about um, writing so you mentioned that were we to adopt park that we wouldn't be testing writing, does that? No, it, it just like? doesn't have a long composition, it has plenty of writing in the uh, test. <laughs> okay, right, okay, so there's not a separate write, That's correct, writing right. component mm -hmm. because there's not a long composition. Mm -hmm. Would that be added to your understanding later on or was that we're just gonna move away from that? Uh, the, write, the kind of writing that it measures is the kind of writing that's consistent with the Common Core mm -hmm. and writing and a, a narrative about, you yeah, know, so. a snow day is not consistent with the Common Core. Got it. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, thanks. Mr. Hainer. I would just ask you folks to push very strongly. Uh, it, it's almost like an unfunded mandate. We will get the technology part and we will get it in place uh, under this mandate and stuff. But the issue that that provides is the concept of immediate feedback. If they were giving Arlington back its results mm -hmm. right away or the communities that had the technology, that would be fine. The reality is it's a statewide assessment and we're going to be compared in the, in the whole thing. I would ask you to push forward that and I would ask all of us to push our legislators and stuff to help the western part of the state because they are still struggling to get into the 20th century. Mm -hmm. And to make this, again, the two components, the measurement of the new uh, curriculum and stuff, that possibly will be there whether I like the test or not. The other aspect of it, the technology, will get there. But right now, we're seeing our test results come back later than MCAS. Uh, this time, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, right. And, and, and whether it's just the shakedown of the, for the full testing or whether it's the, co the component of all the paper uh, aspect of it, how much of the, that is there, I don't know, and they haven't advertised it. People have asked. Right. A lot of what had to happen was the Edwin reports. Um, Edwin Analytics is a statewide system that allows us to analyze data from MCAS. They wanted to get the six most popular Edwin reports set up so you could also analyze data from PARC. And that was one of the reasons why there was a delay in getting the responses out. And they also had to do a crosswalk. Um, in order to do accountability ratings, which will come out in the first week in December, between the two tests, right. and that also held out a lot of the results from coming out. Just real quick, you, measured, you mentioned that the, if the pool of MCAS comes down, uh, I would question if all of a sudden there's 500 communities, the only ones doing MCAS, and all of a sudden, related to that, we get dropped. We could challenge that very quickly. I'm, I'm not saying that that wouldn't be the case. Oh, well, I, no, I'm not I, saying I that it wouldn't be the case that we I, could challenge it. Uh, yes. I, I got an implication of that, and that's not a reason to, to, to go for it. That's all I want to say. Thank you. Question. Uh, Mr. Thielman. So I'm just trying to get the timeline. December 18th, we have to let them know. They've have said that we could have an extension if we, you know, a couple, they're not looking for an extension of two months, but okay. The, okay. if we had well, a reason. Well, well, just let, me, let, question. let the chair Sorry. answer this part of the question. We have a meeting yeah. on December 3rd. We have a meeting on December 17th scheduled. Uh, I the think. Or the, no, the 10th. The 10th. Or, or December 10th, 10th rather. Yeah. 10th so the, and 17th. Yeah, the 10th and the 17th. So that we can talk on the 10th and we can decide on the 17th or it, you know, as the state is giving us the option if we're really deadlocked on this uh, push to the first meeting in January because the state on that conference call said that we would be allowed to delay our decision if necessary go ahead mr. Oh, Thielman. So the, thank you um, w the principals have uh, open what, what don't they have te parent nights or what's going on in the 10th Mm -hmm. Elementary have com oh, conferences. Five conferences mm -hmm. with, so we're conferences. flipping the principals. Yeah. So could they come on the? Se when can the principals come and talk to us about this? That's the what I want to know. Elementary principals are coming on the seventeenth. Okay. So the seventeenth, that evening on the seventeenth, we could also ask the principals mm -hmm. about what their recommendation is on this mm -hmm. matter. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's what I'd like to. If that's okay with everyone mm -hmm. here, yes. I'd like, if it's possible, I'd like mm -hmm. them here on the seventeenth and just sure. ask them what they think. Sure. We could be here anyway. Yeah. We yeah. could. 
I mean, we, we've already it, talked to them, but mm -hmm. you, you can certainly ask. Well, but I want to hear from them. Yeah, absolutely. I want you to hear it from them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, and, but we can also hear from the, the middle school, the high school principal, mm -hmm. everybody can. Okay, so we'll just. Uh, it's not going to impact the high school, but the middle school principal. The middle school, okay. Yeah. So let's bring them, if we can get them all here, ask yeah. them questions and sure. see what they think. Absolutely. The curriculum directors will also be here. Bring them and all. And those would be mm -hmm. good folks to ask as well. That's good. I want to ask them questions. Okay, thank you. Go for it. Okay. My turn. Okay, uh, when I got my principal license, and this was in the uh, early 2000s, uh, they made me go and take the uh, state teacher test, the literacy portion. Mm -hmm. the and one of the things in that literacy portion was a writing sample. And it was, you know, very MCAS-ish. I did this in 2000. I was working in Madison Park at the time. And I, I took the test at English High School. And I'm sitting there. And I'm looking at this, and this thing looks so much like an MCAS long comp question, the thing that teachers were asked mm -hmm. to, to, to write. And, and I was handicapped in this, in that the way I normally write is on a keyboard electronically. The way I edit is I move words around and play with it. I do not write a first draft. I do not then transcribe an edited first dra uh, draft into a test booklet. I don't do that. That's not the way I write. It hasn't been the way I've written for 15, 20 years. And, and that's what we're asking kids to do right now with this long comp. It is ridiculous. It is not the way people write. It does not reflect the way people write. Doing writing on a paper and pencil test in this paradigm is, I, I think it's just an obsolete instrument and it's pure foolishness to expect people to write in a manner that they don't normally write in. Um, so I, I see this paper and pa pencil testing thing is totally obsolete. It, it's, it's just done. It's 1950s technology. The biggest beneficiary of the MCAS right now is UPS, <laughs> who's making a ton of money <laughs> tracking paper taking big cartons of paper, delivering them to schools, having test coordinators, and I've done this job and I hate it, unpacking these boxes, counting test booklets, putting test booklets aside, being responsible for tracking these, and this poor person in the back of the room from the middle school, you have to do that? <laughs> God, God bless you. For 1,200 a, students. 1,200 student school twice during the year, not counting the access, which is the third one, tracking every last booklet, and then the MCAS police knocking on your door if the person who's receiving the package counts one less test booklet than mm -hmm. they think that you had. So this is a huge honking administrative nightmare mm -hmm. to ship a lot of paper around. It's not very green. Um, a lot of carbon being wasted, a lot of UPS drivers uh, employed, and it, it, it makes no sense. It's obsolete, it's not the way to go. Um, obviously, as we're moving towards an electronic test, a uh, computer-based test, uh, we're not there yet. And one of the things that, that the Park Consortium found was Massachusetts was woefully unprepared for the technology compared to the other park states uh, because the state is inadequately funding or taking seriously the deployment of technology into the schools. And that, that's a real problem that everybody's all anxious about. But our biggest school with the biggest test burden, 1,200 kids, and the person who handles the testing is saying, the electronic went pretty well, but the paper and pencil was an absolute bloody nightmare. And you're nodding. Would you come up to the mic, please? <laughs> Stop nodding and help me out here. As the test coordinator at the Odyssey, would you care to weigh in on the uh, on your opinion versus doing a paper MCAS or a, an electronic park? <clears throat> um. mm -hmm. It's not, it's not as, as simple as a yes or no, but mm -hmm. I feel that with preparation, um, the, the park would probably be most beneficial for the adults and the students. 
Um, I find, you know, the man hours that go into the administration of, you know, the test materials, which you just mm -hmm. so eloquently uh, described, mm -hmm. um, is, is time consuming for um, the guidance counselors, the administrators, all the others that are taken away from, mm -hmm. you know, the, the students and other things that they should really should be doing. But um, it does, it takes a village to, to get these tests ready mm -hmm. to be distributed to the different grades. Um, I think in watching the students taking the actual test and when you're the test administrator you actually you you have a control computer and we see each student how they're progressing and going through the questions you kind of have an, an oversight on that in case someone accidentally ed, uh, exits too quickly as dr chesson said they're not done forever you can go back and restart them um, so administratively that's nice too and i i think from what i saw the students um i there were special education students that were tested um, they didn't, I didn't hear of any real issue with the time constraints on them. Mm -hmm. As far as the students who actually took the test in the rooms that I was in, I think maybe we may have had one out of six different classes. I think we had one student who struggled with the time constraint, but that was something that he struggled with all the time. It wasn't something new because of the test. Um, and, and, and if, the, and if at times had electronically, you're not looking at five pages out of unanswered questions. The thing just stops giving you questions. Right, yeah. yeah, so, you know, the students, I think, liked, for the written portions, they liked the, for those students who write and then they have to go back and erase and rewrite, the editing portions were nice for them. There are hoverovers. Um, there's a lot of technical features that are really nice, and same for the math. A lot of the math tools, while they will need some explanation in a tutorial, um, they, the students seem to use them with ease. Um, the, you know, the, the rulers and all the other things that are provided for them for the math mm -hmm. portion. Mm -hmm. um, so like anything, I think um, there's a little, even adult anxiety about this, about, you know, pulling it all off together. Mm -hmm. But I think that, you know, with um, preparation, um, that it's something that we, we could do successfully. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. You know, um, first of all, the issue of accountability. Yeah, we do look at the accountability because we view it as a lever to move things that we're concerned about. And we were, we were concerned earlier on about the persistent lag in growth scores at the middle school, and that has gone away because we've paid attention to it. Mm -hmm. the, that is not the desired outcome. It's merely an indicator. Uh, we've aligned our curriculum. Uh, we've done coaching. We've done all the things to make teaching and learning better and the test scores follow. So if you teach children well, if you have high performing mm -hmm. classrooms, the test scores will follow. Right. I've got a district full of results where if I've got a strong principal, good coaching, good teaching, we do well. Where that falls apart is where we're falling apart. And that's sort of the signal it's sending to us. We're not looking at individual teachers as being a challenge in this district. We have a district full of excellent teachers. When we look at this, we're looking for alignment and systems so that the teachers should never feel pressured from the school committee about testing results. We're using this as an indicator of how the systems are aligning, how our curriculum is aligning, to see if we programmatically need to make changes in the way we're doing business, allocating resources, putting in new curriculum, that, that's sort of a, a, an indicator for us in terms of policy. And from every indication we've seen, we'll get the accountability scores before the, uh, before the December 10th meeting, I believe. Uh, from every indication, just looking at the scores that we've gotten in the past, we've done it very, very well this year, and we're going to be very pleased with the results. But I do want, I as a researcher and somebody who works in this, I want to see for myself, the accountability numbers, how they align to schools that were Park, Park Paper, Park, Park Electronic, and MCAS. And I have a host of job-alike folks who I end up talking to, and I'll have that opportunity to have that conversation. So my mind is not made up, but I want it made clear what my inclinations are is that the key decision in my mind is that we need to move as quickly as possible into the 21st century so that our testing is more authentic. 
kids are better at computers than the adults. The adult anxiety over the computers and computerized testing, I understand, from what I've also seen in the data that we're getting in talking to testing coordinators, assessment directors, and accountability people throughout the state, is that while somewhat more challenging in some of the urban districts, the kids have really taken to the electronic version. Um, the middle school had a positive experience in terms of administering it electronically. The electronic version that's going to be coming down the line is going to be more park-like than MCAS-like. Uh, the consortium, and, and, and I will also say that the problem that we've had with the consortium is that the consortium has withheld data and has not done things in a Massachusetts manner. We have a very competent group of psychometricians and testing folks who work in Malden who do a very good job of presenting results to us. Massachusetts has more disclosure than other states. I've talked to my colleagues in New York where they're not used to getting this qual the quality of data we have. And that one of the reasons why we want to break out of park and do it on our own is the quality of the reporting and the flexibility in the administration we have. And I think that going to MCAS 2.0 with parkish questions and using the consortium as a source of a question bank will allow Massachusetts people to go and have a conversation about the test to look at the results, to look at the question, to see where it's working and where it's not, and make decisions without having to get a whole a dozen states to line up and agree with us. I, I, I think that it's a reasonable approach. We are not a district in trouble in any way and fashion. So I'm not particularly worried about hold harmless, though we're doing well. We've got two more years of doing well, and I think we're doing well. So, um, sight unseat, I take this year's results and hold on to them for another two years and let everybody have two years where, where we're not really looking at the results is it, uh, in an accountability way, that we're looking at results, tra tracking the major change of transitioning to computer-based testing. That's how I'm, I'm looking at it right now. If, if I see reasonable results and valid accountability measures coming out of park districts, and I haven't seen that yet, I'm inclined to go toward park. And the reason why is that I want us to do as much electronic computer-based testing as possible as early as possible. I don't, if, if the decision were to go MCAS paper to park paper, I'd stay put. Because I don't see any future in park paper either. I want us to do this electronically. I want us to do an electronic based test which is more authentic to the things that we are doing in the classroom and what we're aspiring to. We're aspiring to a more electronic based uh, curriculum. We're, we're aspiring to one-on-one -on -one situations. We're aspiring to do the technology. And I want our assessment to align to our aspirations, not to what we were doing in 1999. So that's my consideration in this. I want us going electronic in as many schools as possible um, and if I have to do it using PARC versus MCAS, I'll do the PARC questions to do it electronically. And, and, and that's my bias now. Now, obviously, there's data that's out. I haven't seen our accountability data. I haven't seen anybody else's accountability data. That's a really big validity measure for me. If the, if the accountability data in other districts is coming in screwy and a lot of uh, districts are being are, are holding on to the hold harmless to avoid a big drop, then I've got to think about it a little differently. If the uh, park schools that have done it electronically uh, are reflecting where they really are and 
and folks who are working with that in the buildings think it's going well, that's going to influence my decision. A lot of, lot of, lot of data, a lot of evidence that I need to make an informed decision simply isn't on the table yet, but make no mistake about it. My priority is to get out of the shipping paper business, to get out of the long comp business with the pre-draft and the writing and, and paper and handwriting, to getting to something more authentic, getting something more that is a 21st century instrument, and being able to use the computer as a tool with the manipulatives of the computer <coughs> to get a better sense of how children are doing. Let's see what happens over the next month. But uh, I, if, if I had to vote tonight, I'd be pushing us to go as electronic as possible. Any other questions or comments? Mr. Haynes. I'd just like uh, if we could get a report back, a, a, a state of readiness currently on our technology to implement this test. And if we're not 100% there, how much it will cost and a timeline uh, sure. for acquiring that? Absolutely. <clears throat> I can you. have that for the next meeting. And if there's anything else that the committee would like ahead of time, I'll make sure that you get it before the next meeting. Yeah, we've got two meetings to hash this out, and I'm yeah. sure that we're going to have a lot of people talking to us about Thank this. You. It's a big deal. It really is. Um, uh, electronic signatures for vendor warrants on the agenda. Uh, what, what's come across our uh, electronic table, we're doing this electronically, email, right? Email list from the MASC indicated that uh, we, the, we are now legally able to uh, do vendor warrants electronically uh, rather than having to go to Karen's office and sign them or rather than having the paper in front of us at a meeting. That would be a tremendous advantage, particularly in the summer months when we need to get warrants approved. Uh, the reason why I put this on the agenda is I'd like somebody to move to refer this topic to the um, uh, appropriate subcommittee, which would be policies and procedures. So a motion by Mr. Thielman, second. second by Mr. Hainer. Any discussion on the topic? Second. Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It is now dispatched to policies and procedures. Mr. Hainer. Would it be appropriate to table the next item on uh, for the next meeting because of the time? No, because our next meeting is going to be even more packed. The reason, the only reason I said that is because the report has been done. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, we, we have right, we have fine. people with stuff to She's say. Fine. People She's to left. Put it on. Okay. Oh, okay. She's doing the first. I mean, um, I I'd, I'd like to get this discussion out front. I think we're going we're to, you know, we don't meet again until December 10th. Fine, yeah. fine. Yeah. I just and, and, and we've got we've got principals coming in. We're doing budget. We've got more park. We've got. I'm not let, the let, let, let's, 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 No, we we can get fine. this done. Let's go. Okay. Um, <laughs> Foundation budget review commission final report. Dr. Allison Ampey, uh, Ms. Hansen. <clears throat> Oh, including our I'm sorry. So we brought this to you because we had written the letter back in whenever, April, June, whatever it was, um, to the Foundation Budget Review Commission, which was studying a revision of the Chapter 70 formula and, and all the costs of education in Massachusetts. And they have now put forth their um, report and we had thought it would be nice to just do a quick review of what the report says and then some issues that we found with the report. Mm -hmm. um, and Ms. Hansen's going to walk us through the report and then I'll bring up the issues and what we can expect for money because I like money, um, except that it's not actually funded yet, so it's only wishful money. Yes, hypothetical money, but... Um, So just real quickly, oh, but. Well, maybe you can work on, you know what, this happened before was the other presentation. So you can I'm sing. Gonna, I can just. No. Uh, no. 
See, see, the thing is, is the school department is far more advanced in technology than the selectmen are. It's, it's, that's pretty it's obvious. Really, yeah. It is an eye machine? Yeah. Mm. It is, but <laughs> yeah. the set up in here is hard. Mm. All right. Well, I'm, I'm just going to start talking through this. You can, you have, do you have it? Yes. We have. Yeah. All right. yeah, we, we have, have, it. have it. We have it on, on electronic. Electronic. Yeah. Perfect. Do you want me to do it? That, that's fine. Yeah. That, that's okay. All right. So just really, really quickly over, a uh, quick overview. The mission of the Foundation Budget Review um, Commission was established in the FY15 state budget, and the purpose was to determine the educational programs and services necessary to achieve the Commonwealth educational goals. It was the 20 years. Microphone. Oh, speaking Sorry. to the microphone. Yeah. At the same time. Yeah. So the 20 year update um, since the 1993 Ed Reform Act um, to review the way foundation budgets are calculated and make recommendations for potential changes, determine the educational programs and services necessary to prepare students to achieve passing scores on the MCAS or whatever assessment the state deems um, appropriate and determine the recommended measures to promote the adoption of ways in which resources can be most effectively utilized and consider the most effective and efficient resource allocation. So the new considerations that have really come up in the last 20 years had to do with field and um, research community that suggests that we need to reconsider the adequacy of the budget that was the foundation budget that was passed in 1993 uh, to better meet the needs of the 21st century. And then there was the whole question of the achievement gap and the fact that what we've done really well is quantify the achievement gap over the last 20 years and rethink the foundation budget in terms of what does it really take to get all students up to the proficiency level that we're looking for. And then the moral and fiscal um, focus, again, just about getting everybody up to meeting those same standards. These were the four major factors that were considered. Um, health insurance, the cost of health insurance, special education related costs, ELL related costs and outcomes, and low income related costs and incomes. So I just have one slide on e in each area. For health insurance, the findings were that the district spending on employee benefits and fixed charges exceeded the budget allotment by more than 140%, and the budget did not include retiree health insurance. Mm -hmm. So the recommendations were to adjust to the average GIC rate add retiree health insurance, and have a, a separate health insurance inflation adjustment factor. In the area of special education, the findings were that the percentage of students receiving special education was not the 15% predicted in the original report, but it was closer to 16% on average, and that out-of-district special education costs exceeded foundation budget 59% um, by 59% using the FY13 figures. So the recommendation, and there's some special calculations going on there, but was to assume that the in-district special education enrollment should increase from 3.75% to 4.0% for non-vocational um, students and increase from 4.75 to 5% for vocational students. And to increase the out-of-district special education costs rate to capture the total costs that districts bear before the circuit breaker is triggered. So again, to increase um, costs to make up for the fact that um, the actual costs were exceeding what was predicted by the original foundation budget. Yes, please mm. plug it in, yes. Yeah. <laughs> in the area of English language learners, the finding was that national literature shows that the weights for states with funding formulas um, varied greatly, but in general, Massachusetts was within the range at the high school level, um, students with interrupted education, the SIF, and limited and interrupted formal education, the SLIF, which we're all learning about um, now through our retail classes, um, that these students had huge deficits, especially at the high school level, and very short amount of time to make them up. So the recommendation was to convert the ELL increase from a base rate to an increment on the base rate, apply the increment to vocational school um, students as well, which uh, did not happen in the past, and to increase the increment mm -hmm. for all grade levels to the middle school level, which was kind of in, in the middle there. Um, for low-income students, again, what the literature said was that weightings are all over the place, but in general, Massachusetts was within the range. Um, and, but this is an area where I think they did additional research and really looked at the best practices um, for moving these populations forward in terms of student achievement, um, with the thinking that some 
in, in additional funds in this area might be tied to specific <coughs> research-based mm -hmm. practices that show um, improvements. So the re recommendations here was that to increase the increments for districts with high concentrations of low-income students and ensure any new definition of economically disadvantaged student counts properly and accurately reflect um, the actual population, leave the exact calculation um, up to legislative action, and require districts to post online how they would use those funds. And these were some of the, uh, the successful practices that were identified, uh, particularly with low-income students and students with English as a second language, extending the school day or year, focusing on wraparound services, uh, social and emotional needs, um, instructional improvements for teachers in particular, uh, increased professional development time, increased common planning time, and the use of instructional teams and coaches, targeted class size reductions for the highest need populations, and early education, so full day kindergarten and um, pre-kindergarten. So I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Allison Ampey now, um, who dug in right there. Okay to some, some of the issues with the report. Yeah, so mm -hmm. I took a look at the actual numbers that were in the report and the numbers that were in the documents that they used to build their report. And so the first one, and, and I just wanna point them out because I think we should all know this, it's not talked about at mm -hmm. all. Mm -hmm. um, so the first one was a problem with the calculation of how they reached in-district special education numbers. They claim 4% total FTE in the recommended increase in the assumption from 15 to 16% of students receiving 25% services 25% mm -hmm. of the time. However, the actual numbers that they showed showed 5.7 total FTEs. They never discussed the discrepancy. That's a big gap. Um, so, mm -hmm. in my opinion, the numbers suggest that they're going to be underestimating the in-district special education. The second was looking at the calculation of out-of-district special education. The port report reads, out-of-district special en education enrollment is assumed at 1% of foundation enrollment, which mirrors the rate of out-of-district special education placement statewide. However, the numbers in the presentation cited in the former in-district special education presentation show that out-of-district enrollment is actually 1.33% of foundation budget, uh, foundation enrollment, sorry, that's a mistype. Um, which is 33% higher than the assumption, which again, that's a really big number when you're multiplying that by really big numbers. Um, and that leads to problems with the numbers. Um, when they calculated this out of district special education spending, the report says districts spend far more on special education tuition for out of district placements than what's allocated. In FY13, actual course were 59% higher than foundation budget rate of 25 4,454, what they were talking there is the actual per pupil cost were 59% higher. However, if you look at the whole lump of spending that people did, that was 155% higher than what the foundation budget estimated. So I think, again, they kind of slipped some stuff mm -hmm. under the wool, and so it's going to lead to continued um, under calculations of what the actual needs are. Mm -hmm. um, Wendy and I looked at the report with an eye of, did they actually hear our concerns? A lot of the things were mentioned. What was not mentioned was the special education having higher, aver higher than average, so higher than the 1% statewide distribution of out of district students, um, and also the wage adjustment factor. Um, then we looked at how much money Arlington could hope to get if these things were actually funded. Mm -hmm. The projections, if the formula were, new formula was used, um, using a DESI spreadsheet from June or so that had estimates on special education and healthcare changes, and not knowing how they did this exactly, because all we have is the numbers, we don't have the formula. Mm -hmm. um, it suggests that additional Chapter 70 money required to meet new foundation budgets for Arlington would be three million, almost three and a half million dollars. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, I made estimates of additional um, funding for ELL by subtracting what the extra that we get now and adding in the extra so they're suggesting. I came up with a total ahead of 110,000. It's unclear whether the low income increment would apply to us because we're not a high concentration district, so I didn't add anything else. The total addition, I just lumped it all as chapter 70. It ends up being $3.6 million a year. Um, 
the, there would be an increase in the town's required spending um, to re meet the new foundation budget number of almost 800,000. However, we already pay, gr we already spend greatly in excess of what our requirement is, so we wouldn't see any actual need to spend more money. Um, what wasn't funded was having higher than average special education out of district placements, and that is unknown, but that could be a number that runs into the millions. Um, and again, I don't know how they did their numbers, so I'm not sure if anything was counted. And then the wage adjustment factor inequities that we see here in Arlington is one point, greater than $1.3 million. Mm -hmm. So again, that's unfortunate that that was not count, counted. Um, and then this was just the thoughts and next steps. We wondered if people wanted to talk about where to go from here. Well, you can go back to your own seat. You have a mic. Um, or we can talk about it in another meeting. Well, we can talk about it in another meeting. The, the, you know, I, I, I ran my own set of numbers on this, and I'm coming a little closer to $4 million in terms of an increase in the foundation budget, but there were things that were vague in the report that you couldn't actually plug into, into the current foundation budget formula. The, the other thing is, is that they talked about how the uh, foundation budget formula has been under inflated over the past few years and in fact skipped uh, a cycle so that there'd be uh, an overall adjustment for the entire state based on the deficiencies in, in inflating the existing budget. So uh, I, I think that, you know, you're right that, that it is a report in the shelf and I think that one of the things we need to do is to work with other school committees and MASC in order to pressure the legislature in, to, uh, in terms of fully funding uh, the, the, the foundation budget as it would entail um, uh, providing an adequate education. Now, the other uh, factor in here is that for districts who are spending at foundation, you know, this isn't a hypothetical exercise the required local contribution going up is substantive on top of the uh, Chapter 78. So what I think you might have here is not just a report on the shelf, but you've got evidence that could be brought forward uh, to resuscitate the school funding case. Uh, uh, Hancock v. Driscoll uh, being the most recent, which hasn't been closed out, as additional evidence to prompt the, the, uh, the Supreme, Judicial, uh, Supreme Judicial Court to intervene and mandate that the legislature go and act. And in 93, when we got into ed reform, the legislature acted to set up this foundation budget uh, system uh, because they were being pressured by uh, the McDuffie case. Uh, so uh, perhaps uh, encouraging those at foundation from uh, for pressing the legal initiative, maybe even helping in some way, as well as pressuring our legislators to uh, fully and adequately fund what a true foundation budget is, should probably be our action steps. Any discussion on this matter? So how do we do that? Well, we, we can talk about that later if yeah. we want, but that's sort of, you know, the action plan, and maybe we go to community relations or somehow uh, carve out some time or call Mr. Garbley, uh, Mr. Ra Rogers, and uh, uh, Mr. Donnelly in, and we can have a conversation about this report with our legislators. Okay. That might be a way to do it. That's what I was going to say. I was yeah. going to suggest that. Yeah. just to chair see when they're mm -hmm. free mm -hmm. and have them come in to talk about this because I'm, I'm the, the, the report came out, the legislative session ended, mm -hmm. uh, the FY17, or if it, it set, they, they, they meet again in 2017, so what is the plan? Right. And, mm -hmm. you know, to fund this is going to take an increase in revenue. Mm -hmm. So what's going to be the conversation about mm -hmm. that? Right. It, it, Mr. Hainer. There's been some talk and uh, that a phase-in uh, of 25 percent, 25 percent, and uh, but as, as I shared that with one of uh, my colleagues here, 
by the time you get to the fourth year, we're behind the ball again. <laughs> yeah, I know. So, I, so I mean, 2016 and 2017, I'm thinking, so I mean, I think, you, I mean, I think we, they, we should mean. have a conversation with them here. Yeah. I think it'd be good for the community to know about because this reporter's been out there. A lot of people talked about it. If uh, the legislative delegation came, which they always like to come, mm -hmm. we could just see where they're at and what the reality is. I think we need to get a reality check. What's, where, what's gonna happen and what can the school committee do? Because I'm not sure where, yeah. how to advocate and what to advocate for. Right. So uh, is, is it a sense of this committee that we'd like to invite our yeah. legislators yes. into yes. one of our yes. meetings? Yes. Okay, yeah. then we will do that. Um, any other discussion on this? In, in the new year. After yeah, in the new year, in January. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe try for our first meeting in January. Yeah. Uh, providing that's not a legislature, uh, that's not a date. And that many thanks to Linda yeah. yes. and Kiersey yes, for doing yes. this. Yes, uh, excellent, excellent yes. presentation. Yeah. Ms. Hansen. I just really wanted to briefly say that was really the whole purpose of bringing it back before you. The committee reported out, but then it just seemed to like there was a little splash and then it fizzled. And we were like, no, wait a minute. This is really huge. We really need to get on this. It took years to actually get this Foundation Budget Review Commission passed as part of, you know, an effort to go forward. So I think the idea is to really run with it now and and meet with legislators and and I do want to say though Dr. Allison Ampey really was the main motivator behind this originally so she's done a lot of the heavy lifting on the numbers and it's great that she did that thank you excellent excellent work uh, thank you uh, if we can turn off the projector and uh, either get the superintendent a pair of sunglasses or uh, <laughs> actually just clean you just close the light there because yeah. I need the computer uh, yeah. later she needs okay it. yeah we, we just don't want the superintendent to be in the uh, does anyone need the projector? Yes, yes, yes I yes. do. Kathy needs yes. It. Are we projecting again later tonight? Yes. Yes. Oh. yes. Oh, okay. So. Oh, sorry. Are we? It's, it's a, well, we don't need to move to 10 o'clock. You got time. No, we are going to move. We're going to be done by 10 o'clock. No moving to 10 o'clock. That's what I said. Unless no Mr. Hainer issues, starts a filibuster. No Not an open no. session. <laughs> <laughs> but that, I would add that was great work. Um, I had started to prepare something, but I, I would have to say that you did a, just a superb job of uh, summarizing some of these um, important issues with respect to the foundation budget, which haven't been looked at in a long time. Um, just a couple quick things while we get this set up. Uh, you already heard about the elevator. Mm -hmm. We're get, get comfortable in these seats. Maybe we'll have to get some other people a little bit softer seats or bring some chair pads in. Mm -hmm. No problem. I can No take problem. It. Uh, looks like we'll, we'll the just next fine. two I, meetings will probably fine. still be here. Mm -hmm. I can't put my legs anywhere, but it's just great. It's yeah. just great. Yeah. Just great. It was happy. You're, you're the male ute. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I mean you know. There's a reason I'm being treated like this. I don't know why, but I'm going to think that's right. <laughs> the la I think it was whoever got here last got the that's wood right. chair. Oh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> um, you had an update on Hardy, but just to, just to reiterate it, I'm going to send a note out to Hardy parents. It takes about 8 to 12 weeks to get the parts once ordered. So our understanding is they're going to be here mid-December. So this will eventually get fixed, um, as will the elevator get fixed. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, my superintendent's report this evening is really actually on the budget because we've been working on some very important analysis in thinking about um, the FY17 budget. We have begun the process with administrators, as I mentioned before, of looking at what is important that we need to be um, doing next year in the way of materials, personnel, mm -hmm. and of course there's the issue of enrollment growth. And that has become an, an enormous factor in terms of um, our budgeting. And now that we are beginning uh, this next phase of looking at what Arlington is going to do about enrollment growth, I don't think that we can have the two being the, 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 emph the look at space uh, decoupled from what's going on with our operating budget in the outlying years. And as you know, we have, we have presented to you um, multi-year 
look at our budget with all the assumptions that we've had in the past. And we're doing the same thing here uh, with, a, with a lens looking at um, the enrollment growth and the effect on our budget. Because it's going, it, it is have, going to have a significant effect and it's something that we need to be talking about um, at long range planning mm -hmm. and in the months ahead because the, the two very much are related to each other. How, how I'm ready. you're all set on that? All right. So one of the things that we've been looking at is what is, what has the, the school district actually been spending um, related to enrollment growth? And I'm going to turn this over to Diane Johnson, who you all know, and take a look. We're going to take a look at it through a couple different lenses. Uh, good evening. Um, this first document that <clears throat> is up um, is one of our attempts to try to capture the, instru the instructional uptick in spending related to enrollment growth. So what you see are FY 13 through 16. You see on the far left here, there's a pointer, yeah? Okay, over here. Um, and then the total teacher FTE. So I take the total salary divided by FTE to come up with an average teacher salary. And as you see, the teacher salary has increased over time. Um, this is the change in FTE from the prior year. And so what I've done is I've taken that change FTE, multiplied it by the average teacher salary for that year to come up with an additional salary cost by FTE. We've also included these three factors to try to capture some of the typical costs of increasing our teaching staff. $15,000 for curriculum supplies, $1,000 for a new computer, and 500 for professional development. And these are just rounded numbers to try to get us in the ballpark. All in, that creates the cost all the way out here to the right. If you bring it down here, these are the same numbers carried down here for 14, 15, and 16. FY15 was the first year we realized any impact from the um, enrollment growth factor, additional funding uh, given to us by the town. And that actually represents two years of enrollment growth. So we look at an, at an overall, and, and this is just teachers. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no administrators, there's nothing like that. This is pure teachers. Mm -hmm. You can see that we've increased our spending on teachers about $4.6 million, of which we've received $1.4 million in additional funding, thus eating the differential. And this doesn't set us up for great stuff, as you will see. I think I'm going to start with this model because it's the least shocking. Um, this, uh, this is pretending there will, there will not be a single more student after this year. That 17, 18, 19, 20, and 21, we have no more children. We don't lose any, we don't gain any, mm -hmm. which we obviously know is false. It does show the enrollment growth factor using the current formula as agreed with the town because it always lags a year behind. So this represents the students we added in FY16 being paid out in 17. But from that point onward, there are no increases. The revenue numbers all um, for 17 are adjusted. I've removed the kindergarten grant. I've, re I've rolled Title I back to FY15 levels because we saw a really significant uptick in 16 that I don't think we can trust. So I want to take it back to 15 to be prudent. And I've also put in the differential about $130,000 decrease in our circuit breaker funding because of our better cost containment of special ed expenditures. We do realize less reimbursement in circuit breaker. So that's our total revenue picture for 17. This is our total expense picture for 17, assuming all contract obligations met and 2% growth in every other area, which may or may not be sufficient, but at least it's a starting point. And that brings us out with the tiniest of stuff to handle everything. But in this magical world where we have no more students, you know, maybe. So now we have to go look at something a little more realistic. This, this document here shows a ratio between our existing student population and our existing teacher population at each of the three levels, elementary, middle, and high. 
Once this ratio is created, it's multiplied by the enrollment in the out years to create an FTE needed. Now I hasten to say that this should in no way be taken to be believed as, as completely adequate to our educational needs. This is a mathematical way to tread water with our, with our FTEs. It doesn't mean that the people are in the right place or where the student growth is or meet the needs or all of that. This is just, I really think of it as treading water. This keeps our nose just above the waves. It's, but it is a way to convert the enrollment growth into money to fold it into a long-range plan. This is what I used last year, and these numbers are based on my, on my mathematical projection. And that in, down here when we see the FTE growth, it's multiplied both by the average teacher salary for FY16 and also by the other elements we discussed, curriculum materials, computer, and professional development to give us money. And then we fold that in to the multi-year plan, I have restored the, the um, enrollment growth factor from the town based on the numbers and the 25% reimbursement rate. All the other revenue things remain the same. And we've added in the expense for teacher salary mm -hmm. and the additional supplies for new classrooms. And that puts us $613,000 in potential deficit for FY17 which is pretty much the cost of the teachers. Mm. Now, it was requested that we look at Dr. McKibben's numbers. So I redid the, the teacher calculation, the teacher student teacher ratio calculation using Dr. McKibben's numbers. I did not overwrite FY16. His numbers differed from our actuals. I simply took our actuals and then took his numbers as were in 17, 18, 19, mm. and 20. And then I folded that into the same analysis. And as you see, that is a, an even less attractive picture with mm -hmm. a deficit of about a million dollars in mm -hmm. FY17. Mm -hmm. So can I answer any questions so far? Um, Dr. Seuss. So when I look at McKibben's numbers, the thing that jumps out at me is that at the high school, we're projecting a slight decrease in the student population. So to be consistent, we say, OK, we should decrease the staff. But of course, we're not going to do that, given that that's a one-year drop, right? I mean, we, we want those teachers. We're not firing them and then rehiring them the next year. So, so in that way, it's, it's this, this is the, the yeah, nose yeah, yeah, above yeah. the waves. No, I, I, I know that we're just doing This is just math. Numbers. This is, I, I this that, is but, not best practice. But, this is not what we need. This is just math. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that just struck out. Struck me. Go ahead. One of the things that we can think about is approaching the Long Range Planning Committee meeting, which uh, coincidentally meets on Monday, mm -hmm. to discuss the amount of enrollment growth factor and the formula for calculating that. When we originally proposed this a few years ago, I believe our initial ask was for 50% of per pupil. Mm -hmm. um, and they gave us 25, which is certainly better than zero. Um, but when we look at the only year for, for which we have actual per pupil numbers from the state, it's 13085 right now for FY14. Per pupil mm -hmm. publications always lag several years behind. And we look at the total number of students added in that year. I took it out, I took it out of this analysis. I apologize. I shouldn't have. It works out that the 1.19 increase mm -hmm. is actually 68% of our per pupil cost. Mm -hmm. So even the 50% that we initially asked for is a little conservative. Unfortunately, we don't have the per pupils for, the for 15 and 16. But mm -hmm. I think there is, based on that alone, I think there's some grounding on the idea mm -hmm. that adding these new students is running us well in excess of 25% mm -hmm. of per pupil costs. Mm -hmm. Now, I think we should reasonably expect that in FY15, our per pupil will go up. Mm -hmm. And so that whatever percentage we agree to this year will be based on the FY14 number of 13,085. And then it can, you know, I think, our, I think our number will be higher in 15, but that's mm -hmm. another whole year away. Mm -hmm. So I haven't, in any of these analyses, calculated a different percentage yet. Mm -hmm. But, you know, all of these are predicated, all of these views all of these views are predicated on the 25% reimbursement. But even at 50, 
we would double these numbers and it would certainly help. So let me, let me ask a question here. When the enrollment goes up, the foundation budget goes up. When the foundation budget goes up, Chapter 70 goes up. When, ch when the foundation budget goes up, the minimum local contribution goes up. So by not taking into consideration at all the, um, uh, the enrollment growth, if that were at zero, all the additional Chapter 70 money that was generated by the increased number of students and all the increased required spending generated by that would fall into a town side pot, or be held in, in reserve and not go for the uh, education of the additional children. Is that your understanding? The way the long range plan works is that all revenue from the state goes into the town mm -hmm. and then it's reallocated out to all the departments mm -hmm. um, according to the formula that's agreed upon. So that the, the, money, the, the additional money that's generated above and beyond the plan, because that was based on a fixed number of students, uh, which would have had a fixed trajectory of Chapter 70 money, the increase in the Chapter 70 above and beyond the normal increase, the one that's generated by the additional students, with the intent of the state that that money would be going for the purpose of additional, uh, educating additional students instead of finding its way to, to students, if, if, if it was at a zero, it would be falling into the town reserves instead. I agree with that. So how much in here have we calculated out would be increased required spending locally and increased chapter 70 based on the enrollment? I haven't addressed that at all. Okay. Not at all. Well, that um, certainly is a, a, an interesting question going forward. I understand that we're, we just started doing these calculations in the past couple of days, but that so we, we certainly don't want the increased money that's coming from the state because we have additional students not to be spent on the additional students. I think what plays against us in this, and, and I, I agree with everything you said, but what plays against us is that we're a comparatively wealthy district. Mm. And so the amount of our per pupil that's directly funded by Chapter 7 mm -hmm. is relatively small. And I'm not at all sure that they're not already making good with the 25% mm. per pupil that they're giving us. In fact, I believe they are. Because the Chapter 70 is less than 25%. Correct. But then there's the additional 75% of the required spending. That the, the town would be required to contribute in light of the increased enrollment. Correct, but they're already there's there's no danger there. They're already well in excess of what's required. So, what, but but what would but what it does is the net impact is reducing our peer people spending because the town is above the the, the zero level, uh, the minimum level required. That now that they'd be in a position to it's really pulling back funding on a per pupil basis because instead of the money, the additional money coming from the town to meet the needs of the additional stu uh, students, it's being held by the town. The long range plan giveth and the long range plan taketh away. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have any new streets in town that the town has to maintain? No, I'd like some. Well, you know, this is definitely part of the conversation that we have to have with the long range planning yeah. committee. And, and that's the purpose of looking at yeah. this. Mm -hmm. we're, we're, this is coming up. We have the task force that's going to be starting mm -hmm. the, their discussions uh, on the 30th. Mm -hmm. And we really needed to take, mm -hmm. take a, a good look at mm -hmm. this. This is the first go at it, but it's important mm -hmm. that everyone see this. Mm -hmm. um, I've, I've had numerous conversations with our town manager over the last mm -hmm. couple of days as we've been talking about this. Mm -hmm. And um, I've asked him if he would be willing to for the long range planning meeting to to do a couple versions of the plan if we change the percent mm -hmm. of contribution for enrollment growth uh, say to 40 percent 50 percent 60 percent we know that in 14 we were actually at 68 percent and while there's some money there's some in the to be you know perfectly candid about this there are some positions that are not rela directly related to enrollment. But I have to say, when we were actually going through them, there are very, very few. Mm -hmm. um, they are all related um, to, 
some form of enrollment growth because mm -hmm. even when you increase a classroom at an elementary school, it's not just that teacher. Mm -hmm. There's other, mm -hmm. there are other costs as well, whether they're in extra liaison support, OTPT, mm -hmm. uh, art, music, phys ed. So it's not, mm -hmm. it's simplistic to think about it as mm -hmm. just one classroom. So anyway, that he, has, he said that he would do that. Um, in, our, in our FY14, we looked at this number, and it's the only one that really can be accurate, which was 147 students, by the way. The only one that could be accurate because that's the only year we have, mm -hmm. the per pupil cost. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. uh, Mr. Thielman. So that, the projection you had up on the screen before uh, with the... Uh, with so my projected growth. Yeah, with the projected growth. <clears throat> that allows for an increase in staffing to enrollment. No, it goes above the weight. Mm -hmm. it, it's no. mathematically generated. Mathematically, right, correct, correct. Yeah. But it doesn't... Okay, so that's what I meant. It mathematically generates staffing to enrollment and those above the waves. I got it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't account for any additional things we'd like to do, like the additional coaches that we had talked about earlier. It means we can't mm -hmm. do any of that stuff. Correct. And even when we do the additional staffing above the waves, mm -hmm. we have a deficit. Well, yes, and I would also suspect that we will see class sizes go up. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. The students never, never allocate themselves yeah. evenly. So, yeah. I know that, yeah, yeah right. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> There's crazy kids here. Yeah. You know. <laughs> it's a parent's it's fault. Formula. It is. Yeah, it's, it's our fault. <laughs> but, you know, my numbers here, you know, and again, just to reiterate, my projection merely takes the past and pushes it mm -hmm. forward. Mm -hmm. Dr. McKibben's numbers um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it seems are like a little more dire looking. A lot more days. dire. Yeah. His are, well, yes. Mm -hmm. But his start to tail back, whereas mine never will. Mine are always going to follow the line until there's been several years in a different direction, and then they'll follow a new line. So, you know, whether you're looking at his or mine, you know, there's definitely work we need to do with town to figure out how we're going to manage FY17. Dr. Seuss. Uh, so first, can you remind the committee how much per pupil spending we're talking about 25% of or 50% yes. of? It's the FY14 published number, which is 13085. Mm -hmm. 13085, mm -hmm. okay. And then um, the, uh, the document before that, this one? Uh, no, actually, sorry, it's just, just this, um, this one, the total increased cost of direct educational staffing. Yep. So uh, those numbers, so, so say like, FY16, which is just a single year rather than a double year. Um, the 1161, mm -hmm. is that based on, that That's is based, based on 169 17. additional students, is that right, or? Uh, we had 85, 84, 85 this year. It was based on last year's, mm -hmm. right? Or, oh, so that's what, that's what I want to get clear 80, on. Yeah, this what is this number based? is based on FY15 growth. It always lags a year behind. Right, which is, I think, 169. Well, 169 so, and so the okay. year before. So the 80-some-odd the 80 that we have for this year <laughs> right. translates into the 274 here. Right, right, much lower. Okay. And then, so then, last question, just a get clarification. So the 1161981 is the amount that if we applied the formula that you're applying in the future, had we applied that in the past, uh, so, so oh, sorry. So that that number is um, how many teachers did we need to maintain the ratio times the average cost of the teacher? Is that right? No, that is it's incorrect. Not, okay, that's, that's what this question. is is the number of teachers we added. Yep. Times the average teacher cost. Okay. That's how and we that's generate. That's what the one one six one plus. Okay. Plus these other expenses. Plus those other expenses. It is not related to maintaining the ratios. The ratios are just a way for me okay. to convert students Just to dollars. Yeah. Got it. So it's the actual number of teachers we added, then with these formulas that are our estimates. Okay, or you know means or something. Okay, great. Thanks, uh, Dr. Allison Ampy. Looking at the same sheet, um, the teacher total salaries are those actuals or are those calculated? Nope, those are actuals. That is okay. that, that is, is the real deal. These are the real. Even the FY16 is the. Because yes. the numbers matched up like amazingly, 
Um, if you add up the FYT, if you go to the this sheet mm -hmm. um, and add up the numbers of teachers for FY16, it's exactly, oh, I guess well, that's because that's be. what you should be. Oh, that's right. <laughs> have a problem. All right, no, 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 but do we have, don't we have another, in, in our budget, we should have a count of how many teachers we have. Yes. Mm -hmm. How does that differ from the teacher FTE here? Because um, that's a calculated teacher FTE, right? No, right. that is our actual, that is, actual. this is the actual it's count actual. of teachers. the actual number actual. of teachers. This is what we did. The salary Let's is, see. but. No, the, no, the, the, the FTEs are what we did as well. But the that's FTEs not the number of teachers, what, FTEs. The, Right, but the, the so the teacher FTE column is also the same. It is it, it is what actuals. it is. It is actuals. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it is not the budgeted actuals, it is the actual actuals. Right. No, I'm just because your calculated mm -hmm. actuals is exactly the same. Mm -hmm. Even to the point nine. Yeah. Which I'm I'm just surprised. Modeling doesn't usually work as nicely as that. It's not on this sheet, it's on the other sheet. Or yeah, okay. yeah, it's on that well, one. Well, it should. I mean, FY16 should line up perfectly across all these formats, if I've done my work right. It's Th those really are nice models, those are actuals. Yes, they're not models, they're not actuals. Models, they're actuals. 16 is oh, the real Oh, okay, deal. so those aren't, the should be exact. Those, those aren't the numbers for the multiplication of no. The, it, okay, so even no. though it's in that column, it's not those. No, these oh, are okay. these are our actual numbers this year, oh, okay. and I use them okay. to create the ratio. Okay. I didn't understand that. That's Thank okay. you. You're scaring me, though. You were like, <laughs> no, well, they match. Well, yeah. <laughs> no, but that's. That's like, good. Okay. And obviously, this, th these are the teachers we're actually able to hire and put in place. We've got places where we've got class size issues where we didn't hire a teacher for whatever reason, and we should have. So these numbers are lower those. than what we exactly. really intend to do. And, and we are losing level of service to the children over the past couple of years because class sizes are increasing. Yes. Mm -hmm. In certain places. Right? In certain places. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the thing is, is my understanding when we sat down and did a, uh, a fiscal stability plan, the underlying basis of this was that maintaining level of service and that we're going to maintain library hours, we're going to maintain uh, police officers, we're going to maintain the fire department at current staffing levels, we're going to provide the same level of services through the f fiscal stability plan that we had when we entered into it and did the override. And that was one of the selling points. We went to the town, if you vote for this, we will maintain the level of services that we're providing. And if we're not adjusting to the increased student enrollment, we're not keeping our commitment to the taxpayers to maintain a level of service. So the, the adjustment is really necessary in order to fulfill the commitment to the taxpayers that, that we would maintain services at the level that existed when we voted the last override. I agree. Uh, just to bring to your attention, as was discussed in the last long-range planning, FY17 assumes a three and a quarter increase mm -hmm. and a three in every subsequent year. Mm -hmm. Though it, the initial phase of, mm -hmm. of the, the override vote, it was at three and a half. Mm -hmm. So that's just another point to mm -hmm. bear in mind. Yeah. Mr. Hainer. Is there any thought from the committee and the administration, that number's coming down that the increase in enrollment factor go up. It won't equate, but I mean, if we're gonna lose money on coming back, going down to three, mm -hmm. down to three over a period of time, and we are ha having, I think we all agree, we're gonna have an increase. The numbers may not be exact. And the formula that we're getting from this, the town to deal with that additional enrollment, maybe that should go up a little bit too. Mm -hmm. to offset it a little. Mm -hmm. Just something, I don't know, I'm asking uh, consensus from the committee on, uh, and asking to go forward with that. We may <laughs> not get point. it. That's the point. Yeah. That's the point. That's the point. Yeah. 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 That's the whole point. We're that. um, uh, Dr. Allison Ampey. I'd actually ask, first, is there any way we can make guesstimates on the per pupil cost for FY15 or 16? Uh, can't we just use 13,000 or something? Uh, no, I think it's going to be higher. Okay. but. I'm saying, can we do something to come up with some idea of what 
what um, fraction those numbers are. It seems like we should be able to come up with a per pupil, you know, even if we're lowballing it. Um, but where I'm trying to go with this is I think we need to suggest that the town manager model is something higher than 60%. If our first and only number that we have a handle on is at 68%, we need to have something that's at least in that ballpark. Mm -hmm. I would like us to try and get the ballparks for the other two numbers. It's not possible. And, I mean, but the per pupil cost hasn't changed that much per year. You know, it's it, gone up. No, it, it's it varied change. by, it, change. it changes a little bit, but it doesn't change by magnitudes of thousands and thousands. Right. I mean, not long ago, it was just below $13,000. Right. Like five right. years ago, it was just, you know, 12850 you know, yeah. I mean, it doesn't seem it, to go up rapidly. But if we're not keeping up with the uh, increase in enrollment, those numbers are going to go down relative to, right. you know. That's just going to happen. Yeah. You know. I, I just, I, I, feel, I feel uncomfortable trying to, to mm -hmm. make a per pupil number. Yeah, okay, I, I hear you. Any other, uh, I'm not saying it's for project, for saying that this is the factor that needs to be used but if we are suggesting a range of factors it will you know if it's coming out at 90 percent i'd like to know you know even if it's a, mm -hmm. a estimate and it's not total confidence mm -hmm. i would like to know that and that would affect whether i would tell the manager you know you know model mm -hmm. 70 and 80 percent or something so i just i can't do it off the top of my head looking at this mm -hmm. now but it seems like it's possible so that's all. Uh, Ms. Starks. So I feel like one of the things that I, you know, it's kind of funny because in some ways this is all mm -hmm. a shell game. It doesn't really matter mm -hmm. whether the money is the schools need 8% a year or 3% plus this weird enrollment factor. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, right, right. I feel like what we really need to do is say, can we just reopen the conversation about the real needs of mm -hmm. the schools? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I just feel like it's kind of weird is like, you know, they keep, you know, there's this kindergarten factor and there's the enrollment growth and there's your 3% mm -hmm. and there's this. And I'm just like, okay, can we just come up with a true, and not to say, and I, I, I apologize, I don't have like a way to fix it or, Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you know, I just feel like when we when we when we talk to them, what we really need to do is say, listen, you know, now that we've really got a handle on this, can we sit down and really come up with a realistic formula and and build some of this in? I mean, I think that we're all willing to say that it's okay if it goes up and down with enrollment or costs or whatever. But I mean that you know that there really is obviously. Mm -hmm. You know, because I feel like we, we have this little percent that we get, which they slowly chip away at. And so then we mm -hmm. constantly, like, you know, like the duct tape mm -hmm. at the high school, we're just <laughs> holding it together by, you know, and I just feel like, you know, come on, guys. You know, it's, but, I mean, costs are going up. And, you know, especially now with all the technology stuff, which was never part of the budget, right. you know, so. Uh, I, I do have to say that the Capital Planning Committee has been fairly generous with us the last two years in supporting you know, our mm -hmm. computer rollout. So I, I don't oh, want no, to, no. I don't yeah. want to appeal ungrateful to the significant sums of money they've given us on that, on that no. event. Is it enough? No. Right. But they've given us some real good yeah. whack of money right. and I don't right. want it to right. seem like. No, no, no. I mean, we have to say thank you, but at the same time, well, explain well, that it's well, not enough to live on. Mm -hmm. I think we need to have some sort of percentage just in terms of uh, normal growth of expenses plus an enrollment factor, because that's really what's, what's driving all the conversation. If we were steady at three, three and a half percent with the spend factor, uh, it, everything would be fine, we'd be able to maintain services. But the, the dramatic increase in enrollment we're experiencing is, uh, is, is going to take a toll on what we're able to do if that's not factored into the formula. And I, and I think it's reasonable. I don't think if our enrollment was going down and our need was less, I'm sure that the finance committee would come and say, you know, you've got a couple hundred less kids, you should uh, tighten your belt to reflect that. Actually, isn't but, that, that's part of the Mr. deal. Mr. Thielman. So I, you know, I think we have, um, you know, we have an enrollment challenge, which is causing us to have this whole discussion about a space plan mm -hmm. or facilities plan. And we also have kind of shown tonight, we've shown tonight that we have an operating uh, budget challenge because of the inc increase in enrollment. So we also have to have a conversation about a multi-year plan mm -hmm. 
to have enough revenue to meet our needs over the next several years. So two conversations need to be taking place uh, in terms of long-term planning. F facilities and operational needs, two things. And simultaneously. It would yes, be, they do. It would be the heartbreak of the world to bond classroom additions and right. have them stand empty because right. we can't and staff them. Deficits. Right. 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 So this is a cumulative deficit of, in your numbers, $4 million. Right. Yes. So that's, that's, that's requires a plan. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Kathy wants right. and, to say something. Uh, yeah. Well, if, if it's the committee's wish, I can and talk to the town manager about doing perhaps another, uh, increasing those percentage models. Um, but I just wanted to add another comment on that. I've also been, I have met with parents, and I know you have heard from parents oh, yeah. that the class size numbers, certainly in some schools and in some grade levels, are reaching what, what Arlington would consider unacceptable levels. Mm -hmm. So. It's, we, we are educating our children well, um, but I think people are having a vision of what we could even do better. And so it's, it's, this is a perfect time to have all of this uh, basically talked about. And that's what mm -hmm. the purpose of doing, moving forward with this is to get the full picture of what we're looking at going forward and not just simply the space issues. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Allison Appy. Um, as we talk about trying to connect the conversations about increased enrollment, increasing facilities, um, it brings up that this model, as I understand it, is only talking about teachers. Yes. And when we, especially when we start talking about opening facilities, we have a whole bunch of other people that we're going to need to mm -hmm. be adding yeah. in if yes. we're opening something. Right. And mm -hmm. so I, again, can't tell you how to model that now, but I'm concerned that right now, if that we need to be aware of that and thinking about it and that that's going to end up being a big upchuck in, in uptick in, in um, yeah, sorry. Um, <laughs> yes, in, in spending and need and that we can't forget about that in looking at just the teachers. Yes, this is, this is a, a narrow, narrow lens to look at just teachers because obviously a school needs far more than just teachers. Mm -hmm. Teachers are core. They're right mm -hmm. in front of the kids. They're the most visible piece. Mm -hmm. They're the most important piece without a doubt, but they can't function in the absence of all the other supports yeah. mm -hmm. that are part of a district. And, mm -hmm. you know, I yeah. needed to start there. Yeah. Right. Uh, and, you know, certainly as we expand mm -hmm. space, as certainly as we expand all of this, as we continue to grow, mm -hmm. You know, it, it would be extremely naive to assume that our existing administrative infrastructure could absorb all of this. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, that counselors, this is, you know, yep. across the board. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. mm -hmm. Okay. Very quickly, let's. Uh, and, you know, Mr. Hainer. Question for the superintendent unrelated to this. So I'll. I'll if this unrelated. Is the, so let's finish this. Yeah. Uh, let's we'll finish, finish this yes. and then we'll resume the uh, superintendent's report. Are any other questions or comments on this? Excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Bowie. I have nothing else to, uh, to bring up this evening. The other night it just struck me at Permanent Town Building Committee when we were talking about Stratton and everything. Way back when uh, we talked about you uh, or somebody coming and talk to us about the type of modular units that mm -hmm. we're going to get for our input. And uh, so where are we on the time? I know we're coming up to a, a, a potential town meeting. Uh, so. We, we're we going to be putting the bids out fairly soon uh, for the modular mm -hmm. for the modular piece. I think that part of it is is pretty much ready to go. And we can, in terms of, what I'm saying, oh, ready to computer. go in terms of the specs of them. Okay. I yeah, need I, that computer. You that, want to have somebody from a modular company no, come no. in? No. no, no. Well, that was way back when we, had, when we were talking. What I'm, I thought we were going to have some discussion, potential input before the specs were, were, were done. Well, I they're mean, not really completely done. What, what, oh, what type what of... I, okay, the, let me put it up. I know how many rooms we're going to have, uh, rooms, and, and I saw an outline of a configuration. Uh, I'm talking about heating, I'm talking about air conditioning, I'm talking about uh, uh, the actual physical plant. Uh, it's more than just four walls for each classroom. I, I didn't know... It, Questions like, are there going to be bookcases? Are there going to be uh, closets? Uh, where are the kids' coats going to go? And things of that nature. 
Okay, there's not going to be closets. There might be some bookcases, and the and the kids' clothing will go in the classroom. Mm -hmm. Okay, How, the heat, the heating. Uh, do are, are there individual controls for heating and AC? Yes. So the, the, the we are going to do AC. That is an option, but we are going to have AC. There is the, going to be AC. Yes. Okay. Can we, can we get can a we, report can, on this at uh, some point? Can yeah. we? Yes, we can. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. That's what I was asking for. Can, can we, no, you're right. Can you're right. we get a report, or ref, if we need to refer it to uh, facilities? The facilities? We, well, can, we can have a complete report um, for the December 10th great. meeting. Okay, thank fine. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, oh, yeah. it's not really a consent agenda because there's one item. So, a motion to <laughs> approve the warrant 16059, dated 11 12 2015, in the amount of $80,942.64, moved by uh, Dr. Sue, seconded by Ms. Starks. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That's approved. Policies and procedures. Okay, speaking for Mr. Pierce. Um, we bring to you from the Policy and Procedure Committee the first reading of BEDB, which is Agenda Format and Preparation and Dissemination. It's been revised. Um, the committees will, the full committees will have been to, for us to look at it and to determine if, when we thought that committee members should be receiving materials. Um, just a second, let me pull it up. Um, this was brought as a first read to get input from the rest of you, mm -hmm. and then we'll go back and revise it. We've already heard from Ms. Fitzgerald, mm -hmm. who had some suggestions which we will incorporate. For example, she said that the administrative assistant would need to receive materials by 10 a.m. on Friday so that she would have time to upload them mm -hmm. into Novus. Mm -hmm. um, but if anyone has any comments on what we're thinking, mm -hmm. they can get it to us before we meet again. Mm -hmm. And I don't, mm -hmm. do we have a, another meeting scheduled yet? I don't remember. Uh, no, we don't. Any, no, yeah, so. yeah, one other yeah. thing I'd like you to look at is the time that we release all the supplementary materials because the selectmen do it um, ahead of time and I think that we should we should adopt mm -hmm. that so that okay. no later than right. th that Tuesday where we've got that second wave of presentation materials we should be opening everything up mm -hmm. and if we can incorporate that into the policy because right now the policy states that we open the supplemental materials at, at the time the meeting starts and uh, if we expect to, the to open to the public oh, because okay. yeah. uh, if if we ha have access to it nobody okay. else does you know, they're, they're sitting there guessing what this agenda right. item is about, and I don't okay. think it's really reasonable. Yes. Yeah. And I actually, mm. I think we need to have more conversation with Ms. Fitzgerald mm. as to can things be, mm -hmm. can you have essentially a draft agenda mm -hmm. open in Novus, and then it can become finalized. Yes. And right. I just, mm -hmm. not, not now, we'll come talk right, to right, you right. and yeah. find out what okay. the options are. Um, because I think that's part of what we're trying to suggest, mm -hmm. and I, Yes. I'm wondering if that's possible in Nova. So, um, uh, Asha, okay. I, I think if Ms. Fitzgerald could come to a meeting, that would be helpful, or just have, have a quick mm -hmm. conversation, right. that would be great. We'll okay, any great. other comments on this policy before it goes back to policies and procedures? Mr. Sprague is smiling. Uh, thank you. Um, budget. Okay, bu budget. Um, okay, budget. Sorry, I'm juggling too many things here. Doing updates, you're gonna have problems. Uh, no, I guess okay. I will bring my computer over. Budget, what? Okay. Um, budget met um, this week, and we discussed at the request of the administration the new rental fee structure for the Pierce Field. Mm -hmm. At our meeting on the third, we had heard a preliminary version. Comments. We also heard comments, questions about the legality and the cost to youth sports. Um, we sought advice in between our meetings from town council and also mm -hmm. had some further discussions with Ms. Neville about um, how to reconfigure the rates. And Dr. Bodie, did you want to present the, um, the final sheet? I mean, what was done? It, it's, it should be in your mm -hmm. packet in the there, packet. in Nova. Mm -hmm. um. Okay, so I Reference material, agenda format prep. No, that's the only thing that's in yeah, there. Yeah, we that's don't. That's the only thing. Mm. 
Um, uh, okay, it's not so, in there? Uh, no. I don't know if it's in Novus. I didn't look in Novus. What? Um, no. Not online. This one, this one. No, it's not online. Oh, well, there's. Not quite sure what. We're, we're not sure what happened. But any, mm. at any rate, I'm, I apologize that if it's not in there because we had it there ready to go. Mm. Um, let me just like, give a, a little bit of a, a little contextual piece on this. As you all know, the town has uh, invested an, about a half a million dollars in a new turf field, which mm. was desperately needed. Mm -hmm. And now that we have that turf field, mm -hmm. we want to make sure that that is well maintained. Mm -hmm. um, there were things that probably should have been done that, that um, we got a long life out of the last one, no doubt about it, but um, there were probably things we could have done along the way to have made it even uh, um, hold up a little, maybe not longer, but certainly been better conditioned during that period of time for the users of it. Approximately, slightly over 50% of the time, the high school uh, athletic teams use Pierce Field. Mm -hmm. So we've been looking at, you know, what, what are we going to do in terms of maintaining that field? What will be the essential costs that, have gone, that are necessary to have, have it be something that we're going to have for a long time. Particularly with all the other costs that this town is facing, it's, it's really absolutely important that we, we, we spend uh, this effort to do that. So this summer, we, we did some preliminary look at what, the, what all of the different uh, budget items would be um, that would be necessary. There, it, one of them has to do with just the maintenance of the field. Mm -hmm. It's a $7,000 a year contract to fluff up the field. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I know, it's, a, it, it's, it's actually a, a special, a special machine that comes in yeah. to do it. Then every year there's a, a cost of, for lines of 6500 mm -hmm. One of the things that there is just a huge consensus on is that we need somebody there when we have users um, non-high school users mm -hmm. to be monitoring the field in just terms of usage and take, taking care of it. There's also uh, also ancillary things with the field such as the press box and, mm -hmm. and, and different equipment that is used and, and used by users, um, concession stand bathrooms and so forth. So what we're proposing to do is to have uh, field monitors in place when we have users that are not high school. And when we have high school users, we have coaches mm -hmm. that are there watching, make, watching over everything. There's also equipment maintenance. There's a lot of things um, uh, such as press the uh, scoreboard. Mm -hmm. We've had to replace the scoreboard in the past, which is not inexpensive. Mm -hmm. And then the controls for the scoreboard. There's a number of things that are required and we figured the annual maintenance on that would be around 2,500. And then there's also equipment replacement that, that needs to be built in. Um, also custodial detail, how we're thinking about custodial detail is to have it staggered um, over events so that it's not concurrent, mm -hmm. but, at this, but might be halfway through the event and then after so we can have the, the cleanup. We now have DPW uh, picking up the trash, mm -hmm. uh, but that's not, a free service is something that we um, compensate mm -hmm. DPW for. There's also going to be the need for some administrative costs in coordinating mm -hmm. uh, the schedules with the monitors and just d doing all of the, um, making sure all the maintenance is maintained on the field. Um, and then there's supplies. Mm -hmm. There's custodial supplies in terms of toilet paper and paper towels and cleaning materials and that has been costed out. So that has been costed out I'm sorry you don't have this in front of you, but it's been costed out around 51000 of which we're taking away from that amount of money the things that the high school would be um, responsible for because of their usage. Mm -hmm. And through this process of, of, of looking at our costs, seeing, what, seeing how we can keep them as reduced as much as possible, and we, we've been before the budget subcommittee and they gave us some great suggestions. We also this summer met with users 
and continue to involve users in this process so that they, they, um, are, they can give us feedback. And in fact, the feedback they gave us this summer resulted in the numbers that we eventually went to budget with, but now have been more refined. So the, at the end of this process, what we're um, proposing, and this is considered a first read tonight. I'm not expecting any kind of zero decision. Read. We no, 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 yeah, no. we're not reading it. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so it'll be a, it'll be a zero read. We'll have we'll get those I'll documents. They're, the they're there. And I, we can have a Xerox machine. We can we, we don't have to use oh. the Xerox no. machine. No. Okay. Um, <laughs> we would be looking at changing some of the fees. Um, currently, none of our none of our um, youth <coughs> don't pay anything and mm -hmm. haven't been paying anything over the years. Mm -hmm. And really after doing some sharp pencils, sharp, uh, sharpening our pencils on this, the proposal would be that, that the youth groups would now be paying $35 an hour and if you added lights, which would be, uh, we've costed out to mm -hmm. be approximately $50 an hour, their per hour with lights would be 85 um, we've increased some of the other costs uh, for other groups s to meet the cost. Our intention in this is not to make any money. This is not in any way, shape, or form a revenue enhancer. This is really simply mm -hmm. to maintain the field. So um, what we were hoping to be able to do is to um, get an approval down the road. And as I said, well, this is probably obviously now just the first introduction to this in some ways for the whole committee. Um, so that we can put on a trial basis these fees in place for the spring. And youth groups is, and, and other groups need to have some notification, which I think probably by January would be sufficient. And we'll, we'll track very closely what our costs are and are very happy to adjust these costs um, so that next year in the fall we have you know, perhaps, perhaps they can come down even more. Mm -hmm. And maybe even as we go through it there could be some adjustments at the end of the season. Because again, our intention is not to make money on this, but to make sure that we have everything in place as necessary for a um, well-maintained field. Mm. So uh, I'm sorry you don't have the materials. We'll get them to you, and we'll come back to this on December 10th. Mm. But you'll have those tomorrow. The, the sure. budget subcommittee was, was mm -hmm. ready to approve the new rental fees mm. as you will see um, mm -hmm. for use during a trial. We were suggesting a trial period of approximately six months, and then the numbers can mm -hmm. be revisited um, <coughs> and see if it, it shakes out. Okay, but we'll do that next time. We will present it next time. Yeah. Um, facilities. All right, so um, we met right before this meeting, um, and my goal was just to. Uh, oh, well, there's one over there. I'll talk here there. first. Um, our goal f was really to make sure that we have all the documentation and that we are prepared for the meeting of the school enrollment task force. Um, and uh, so what, um, so we made a list of documents, like, you know, we think that everybody should get these documents that we had, which are the, mm -hmm. you know, numbers, basically, of where everything is, what the classrooms are. But, um, I will continue this to the next microphone. Mm -hmm. uh, it felt that, the problem with those numbers um, is that they don't really show where the impact is. It's really hard. You have to put it all together. And I wanted there to be some kind of a document that kind of showed you visually. So, um, so this is what we did. Now, I, have to, I also have to preface this with the fact that um, these, the colors are mine. They are not Dr. Bodie's. Um, they do not reflect what we know is going to happen. So what I did was I entered in the spreadsheet um, the current classroom sizes. So the, those are just numbers of students in every classroom. Mm -hmm. So if you start at Bishop, um, and then what I did, my own personal mm -hmm. thing here, um, is that it's red if I feel like those are unacceptable class sizes and they should be broken up into fewer classes. They are yellow if I feel like they should be on a watch like that they're getting dangerously close to being broken up and they are blank if in fact the class sizes are pretty okay and they actually have some grow room there for a couple of kids. My, my goal was to make sure that when we go into the meeting, the larger meeting, that we can tell them these are the schools that are level one. They are on fire. They need help this year. 
Mm -hmm. And we have a list also of what our level two schools are. Like they're getting dangerously close. They don't need anything this year, but they are going to need it the year after. And then probably level three schools, which are pretty okay. So, um, and this is just the elementary schools, obviously. Um, as you can see, Pierce and Stratton are the only two in the green. Green means they're good, they're go, they got more than enough class sizes. Um, adequate it, class sizes. Adequate class sizes and adequate classes in the school to hold the classes that we need. Um, in the yellow, so kind of in the next level up, is bracket. Um, but you can see that it's actually, by my estimation, uh, Bishop and Thompson are really the two that are going to, are exploding. Bishop, because it has just horrendous class sizes right now, which I feel like we should fix. Thompson, which we know, not only because uh, we have this problem where kindergartens are growing at four classes a year, and we're popping them off only at two a year. So it, it's kind of got a double-edged sword. Um, and that really Brackett, Dallin, and Hardy are, uh, Dallin and Hardy are up next. Um, they are really close depending on how many incoming kindergartners. They might be okay, they might be in the yellow, um, at least for the next year. But I feel like one of the things that we need to make sure when we go into this uh, kind of town-wide meeting is to really make it clear where the stressors are. And I felt like I wanted to have some kind of a visual on that. Now, whether or not we all agree with kind of which classes should be broken up or not, I feel like is, you know, I can, I, I'm going to leave that in there for colors and for the sake of the discussion. Um, but I feel like one of the things that I am hearing a lot from parents uh, currently, um, and not just at Dallin or any particular school, but kind of across the board, is that our elementary class sizes are too big, that mm -hmm. they think. 25 is too big, um, you know, and anything over that is absolutely too big. And so um, I considered that when I went through, red to me meant, you know, the, the classes were just way too mm -hmm. big um, in those schools. So um, I don't know, this is just, I was just trying to make sure that we could have some way that we went in there. I think that, so not only do they need the background material, which is what I used to create this, but some understanding from us as to which schools are clearly um, level one, like mm -hmm. we absolutely have to do them just so that we know where we're headed with this discussion. Um, so I just wanted to mm -hmm. share that and take any feedback on that from people. Great, mm -hmm. <laughs> Great job. Um, comments, hearing none. Yep, Dr. Seuss. Oh, just a question. Um, do you have different numbers for what you think is red for kindergarten level than you do for fifth grade, because it, it seems to me that that feels different, right, a class of 20. Uh, I didn't touch the fifth grades because they're leaving. Mm -hmm. Right, okay, right. So knowing that there's no fixing them, yeah. because all these fixes will happen next year. Yeah. So mm -hmm. in my mind, where I could, mm -hmm. I thought we should mitigate. Mm -hmm. Now, none of, all of the red here is not currently in the budget. Oh yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. So we, you know and the that's right, mm -hmm. right, right, right. We don't so, have the teachers, we don't have the, we don't have the class. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah, yeah. right, right, right. Yeah. So this is just a you know if I'm also going to start while we're thinking about budget and the enrollment problem, we also need to think about the fact that we have to stop just continuously shoving more students into the same number of classes. Mm -hmm. um, so we have the big trifecta going on. But um, I feel like this. I mean, I, I noticed when we were looking at the, you know, when we last got these numbers that I started to like circle where class sizes were too big and, and everything 25 and above. And, and I feel like some of this is what I felt like was missing in the McKibben report. Like he, mm -hmm. he did raw numbers in his own way, but he wasn't looking at then also what we think mm -hmm. the class size should be. And I know that that's a discussion that I am continuing to push um, and trying to figure out what the right class size is and how we define that. But um, this is kind of, yeah. It is 10 o'clock. I want to know the uh, will of the committee. Um, move the 10 <laughs> o'clock rule. I think, I think I second. I think we should keep uh, uh, To 10.30. Okay, motion by <laughs> Ms. Starks. We're going to do it again. Second again. by Dr. Seuss to move the 10 o'clock rule to 10.30. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? It's a unanimous but unhappy vote. I'd just like <laughs> to take note that the prior chair never had to do that. 
That's because the prior chair didn't have to worry about the prior chair's filibustering. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> After you talk tonight? Please. <laughs> Please. Not often, but we are tonight. <laughs> so, but I do want to make sure if anybody has any, you know, input or feedback, um, let me know. Uh, you know, I just feel like we certainly, as we head into that meeting, which it looks like is now going to be what this it's November thirtieth, mm -hmm. yes. which is a Monday. I don't think we have a place yet. Uh, Did they say I where? I mentioned it tonight. I think we're going to be in the conference room. Oh, okay. They, they didn't tell us that, um, but it is at 7 o'clock on Monday, November 30th, will be the first meeting of the school enrollment task force. Um, Dr. Allison Ampey. Um, I'm just looking at this with an eye to paying for it, and while I really wish we could achieve everything you're suggesting we need to achieve, I'm concerned that the funds are not currently in our budget mm -hmm. as it is so created. And I am worried that we'll be setting up unrealistic, you know, just going in and saying, oh, we're going to do this mm -hmm. is going to set up unrealistic expectations with parents. And, and I'm just, I'm concerned about this. Oh, I, I didn't mean it as any way, shape, or form that. It's mostly to show where the enrollment mm -hmm. growth is pushing the edges of the schools. Mm -hmm. So in this way, even without the numbers, mm -hmm. I think what I did was yeah. just try to say, okay, right. it's Thompson and Bishop mm -hmm. that are under the most pressure, mm -hmm. and then we can see where it goes from there. Okay. Um, whether we do this or not, but I feel like you need to see it's hard to see just from looking at numbers yeah, yeah. why why we the school committee think that you know if you look at this well bishop is okay they've got you know an extra classroom they're using 18 classrooms why is that a problem mm -hmm. i'm like well because there's way too many kids in each one of those classrooms mm -hmm. so i just wanted to mm -hmm. you know it doesn't make any promises or any kind of mm. It's what I'd love to have happen, but I know that it's not in the budget and that it's not there. We're making two separate arguments here, and this is the other half of it. Yeah. Right. Uh, Mr. Heaney. I'm set. Thank uh, you. Oh, I just want to quickly Dr. say. Dr. Seuss. I, I, was with the, I was at the Bishop PTO last night, and I think what I got very clearly from them is that they felt a little left out because yeah. mm. when you looked at McKibbins, hey, they don't look like they're getting worse, but they're not getting better. Yeah. And their numbers are already unacceptably high. Yep. So, they are. so I, I'm glad that you're drawing attention to that mm. uh, as we also draw attention to all of our other needs mm. in the district. Right. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, district Accountability, Curriculum Instruction Assessment. No report. Uh, community Relations. Uh, we met on the 16th. We did a second read of the survey summary. Uh, it's going to go for a third read at our next meeting. Uh, we also discussed two public meetings, mm -hmm. one on the enrollment uh, mm -hmm. um, challenges uh, tentatively for January 7th mm -hmm. with a snow date of the 13th. This will be a town hall meeting mm -hmm. that may or may not appropriately be called a charrette, but this kind of like big community-wide meeting, um, visioning meeting. Mm -hmm. Uh, we also discussed uh, sort of starting a process mm -hmm. of having public conversations about issues that are important to the district. Mm -hmm. uh, first one tentatively to happen end of March, early April on curriculum, assessments, um, common core. Mm -hmm. uh, we think these are things that, that people want to have a conversation about mm -hmm. and we want to help facilitate that. Thank you. Yeah. Executive session minute review. I am uh, attended a meeting with town council to, uh, I want to share with him what we, uh, we'd like him to do. Mm -hmm. As soon as I've done that, I will contact uh, our secretary and set up that review. Warren committee. Everybody get paid again? School enrollment task force is going to meet. Going to meet on the 30th of November, okay, 7 we've, p.m. We've now come to the end of the regular agenda. We but now approach, yeah. Quick announcement. Oh, announcements, yes. Thank you. Uh, uh, Dr. Ampey and I attended the EDCO meeting uh, the other day for school committee. Mm -hmm. I'll just, just the topics one would heavily discuss was park, mm -hmm. and the second one was starting time at schools, mm -hmm. and uh, high schools, and high schools. And high schools. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, the other announcement I'd like to share with the I, last meeting I talked about uh, the Thompson third grade doing an, uh, the town meeting. They did it. They had four articles presented. Three failed and one passed. Oh. <laughs> Mm. Thank you. 
Okay, uh, executive session, uh, motion to go into executive session to conduct strategy sessions, preparation for negotiations with union and or non-union personnel, or contract negotiations with union and or non-union, in, in which if held in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect or to conduct strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation in which, it, it, well, this doesn't apply. So for the first item is the... Uh, uh, executive session motion by Dr. Seuss, second by Mr. Hainer. Roll call. Dr. Aye. Allison Ampey, Mr. Aye. Thielman, Dr. Aye. Seuss, the chair votes aye. Uh, Ms. Starks, Mr. Hainer. Aye. It is a unanimous vote, 6 nothing. Thank you for everyone for coming out tonight and watching us in this beautiful room. We're not returning. We are. We are not returning to a oh, public session. Oh, okay. yeah. For, uh, for anybody who is room, concerned yeah. with that. Mm -hmm.